um, uh, a few other um, uh, uh, famous authors. Um, and alongside that, there's also going to be an, an issue of architectural design, um, which uh, will be coming out next year as well, which Matthias Del Campo and I are uh, editing, and that's in the final stage of production at the moment. Um, um, I'm also involved in a couple of other publications about AI, but I won't go into those right now. So at last, it seems, I think, that the, the, the world of architecture in the UK, at least the publishing industry, is taking seriously um, all the possibilities of um, operating in, the, in um, of the potential contribution of AI towards um, architecture itself. So I wanted to, to address that today. Um, but let me just say some introductory remarks. And given the fact that you've already been given a very sophisticated lecture by Theodorus, um, uh, um, maybe this is kind of going backwards in time. But I want to sort of kind of clarify some things for those who are completely new to this, who don't know what AI is, um, and, and just to give some kind of background. And I, there'll be a very schematic background, but just some, some key points to kind of emphasize. Um, let me start then with um, a, a quote by Margaret Bowden. Uh, she is um, a very significant voice in the world of, uh, of cognitive sciences and of AI and of creativity and so on. Uh, she uh, um, is teaching, uh, still, still, te still active at the University of Sussex. And she makes this kind of this comment, which maybe was a standard comment um, um, uh, until recently, AI seeks to make computers do the sort of things that minds can do. Um, is, is that still true? Does that does that description still make sense? Um, I, I think in many ways um, it's it's out of date because what we've discovered is in fact is that computers can do things can far exceed the potential of what human minds can do. Um, and the first maybe glimpse of that came in well not the first glimpse but the book, but the public became. Um, made aware in a somewhat shocking fashion in 1997 when Gary Kasparov, the world, the then world uh, chess champion, was beaten by Deep Blue, um, which really was, was, was something that nobody expected um, and brought AI to the attention of the world. Of course, things have gone on since then. This was a, a, an expert system. We've now developed uh, learning systems and so on. But nonetheless, this itself was a significant moment. And Gary Kasparov um, uh, both acknowledges the fact that actually um, uh, we've got to concede the fact that, that the machines are eventually going to be much better than us um, in everything that we do um, eventually. Um, but he also claims it as a, a, a kind of human triumph because it was human beings who um, put together the um, uh, who, who, who devised uh, Deep Blue. Um, so the question then, uh, maybe the question, not so much what is AI as so much as where is AI? And, and I think uh, what is interesting is that AI has completely infiltrated our world and yet we might not even be aware of it. Um, it's what filters our spam on our emails. It's what identifies our friends on Facebook and, and recognizes objects on Instagram. Uh, it's what... Uh, um, uh, translates um, uh, text. I use WeChat a lot, and it's extremely good at translating Chinese into English now. Um, it's what uh, re recommends us movies on Sp Spotify or, or books on Amazon. Um, it's what, in, throughout the home, we have um, Alexa, Cortona, and all these AI assists that are um, that are there, uh, primitive forms of AI, but AI nonetheless. We have um, Nest thermostats that are controlling our heating. When we're driving our car, we, we're warned that we're straying out of lane by AI. All the transponders and things are operating through AI. And we, of course, we even have um, uh, self-driving cars of a, of, a, of a type, of a fashion at the moment. Um, likewise, in the office, it's kind of, it's, it's scheduling our meetings, reminding us about our meetings. It's finishing off our, our, um, our sentences on Gmail and so on and so on. Almost every aspect of, of, of our kind of terrestrial existence is in some somehow assisted by AI. And also I would say extraterrestrial in the sense that space, SpaceX is a company that uses AI uh, throughout its, in its kind of space exploration endeavors. And more recently, and recently um, NASA landed its, its, uh, its rover on Mars using AI. It's absolutely everywhere. And yet the paradox about it is AI is invisible. It's, it, is, it is completely invisible. We're not aware of it half the time, but it is there. In fact, if you want to think what AI is, forget humanoid robots and think algorithms. 
that's essentially what AI is. It's essentially software of a type. And it's not necessarily physical at all. So these kind of humanoid robots make absolutely no sense. That is not what AI is all about. Um, so this is a quote from, from my book. It is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, super intelligent alien species. And I think we must, must be aware of, of um, the people who are trying to kind of like cash in on AI. Um, uh, I don't know if you're aware of uh, Sophia, the humanoid robot. Um, um, uh, and here, seen here, there's an online, you can find a video where she and Will Smith, Will Smith is having a date with Sophia and doesn't get very far. It's, it's entertaining, it's amusing for sure. But the idea that somehow that that's, con that's conveyed here that uh, Sophia is a sentient, aware, conscious um, uh, robot is completely flawed. Uh, in fact, the scientific community is, or the, the AI and the robotic community is completely outraged by Sophia. Um, Rodney, Brooks regard, Rodney Brooks, who's a very famous roboticist, regards Sophia as completely bogus, a total sham. And Benedict Evans, somewhat unfairly perhaps, is a bit, because uh, Sophia is a bit more than that, a tape recorder with a rubber head on it. Maybe not so. I mean, for sure, you know, it, uh, um, we have to recognize that, that, that AI is involved in Sophia, um, and there are different forms of AI, and I won't go into the distinction now, but, you know, simple, anything that is programmed is basically AI, AI at some basic level, such as Grasshopper. What is more interesting are the, the, the recent developments that have gone into machine learning and, and machine, um, and machine intelligence. Uh, even architects have been taken in by this. I saw this at the, the recent Venice Biennale. Biennale. Uh, they somehow thought that Sophia was uh, a, a, a example of cutting edge AI. It's simply an example of marketing. And I think we, we, because of uh, the, the invisibility of AI, we have to be, be alert to the, to the dangers of, of marketing. Sophia is marketed by Hanson Robotics, and they use it as a kind of way of promoting themselves. And in fact, one could even say that any, any company, it's been said, actually Theodorus, the one who said this to me, um, if ever you see AI in the name of a, of a company, um, the chances are they're not using AI. I, was, I met the CEO of AI Space Factory in, in Shanghai a couple of years ago, and I was intrigued by the fact that it had AI in the title. And I asked him well, how they were using AI. And he said, well, they weren't actually using it. They eventually they had some aspirations to use it, but they weren't actually use it. I think one can also be very suspicious about AI Build, a company based in London that has, also has AI in its, in its, in its, um, in its name. Um, I won't say any more about that. So in a sense, this is kind of almost like the, the, the logic of inverse camouflage. If camouflage is to pretend something isn't there when it's there, then inverse camouflage is to pretend something is there when it's not. So AI is very susceptible to that kind of um, um, uh, uh, marketing. Um, beware the AI of marketing, as another comment I made in my book. In fact, the, the key thing about AI is it's not conscious. It's not aware. Um, Sophia, despite appearances, is not aware of what she's saying. She's totally programmed. Just as your, your I mean, there's no more kind of uh, sense of self-awareness than in your pocket calculator. There's, this is simply a, a kind of machine in some ways. And the idea that somehow the computation, the greater computational power will lead to, to consciousness, will lead to AGI, artificial general intelligence, I think is something of a myth. I personally don't think that, uh, that that we're going to get consciousness from, from robots. Um, uh, does it matter? Probably not. Um, but I, I think uh, Anil Seth, and I want to just draw attention to someone else from the UK, also from the University of Sussex, a really astonishing figure, uh, Anil Seth, who has this fabulous TED talk um, about your about your brain and hallucinating your conscious reality. It's really a fantastic set, TED talk. His book, Being You, came out last week, and uh, this has become a bestseller already. And the point he makes that the chances are of AI ever becoming conscious um, are pretty remote. And, and, and Anil Seth, I should say, did a PhD in AI before he became, went into neuroscience. He's now one of the leading figures in, in, in neuroscience, or computational neuroscience, should we say. So I don't think necessarily that, that AI will ever become conscious, um, but it will certainly become far more intelligent in a certain way than us. Um, and Max Tegmark um, makes the kind of comment, which I think is absolutely correct. Um, this suggests as we humans prepare to be humbled by ever smarter machine, we should take comfort mainly in being homo sentience, in other words, in being conscious, are not homo sapiens. It's not our intelligence is going to stand out. It's going to be uh, the fact that we are conscious. Um, so 
Uh, jumping forward, really, to the, the issue that I think is at, at the center of, of AI today in terms of architecture, um, the possibility of how you might generate um, AI, hallucinate AI, synthesize is another term that's been used. Um, and I, I will, I'm skipping out a whole history here, um, but just to kind of make a comment, uh, uh, um, uh, um, to, to, to quote um Makoto Se Watanabe, who um, wrote an article for a book that he published in 2017, he must have said this in, I think, in 2016, and I would say that he is somebody that is quite open-minded towards the possibility of what AI can produce. But at the time, he said, but people are the only ones who can create an image that does not yet exist. Machines do not have dreams. I've yet to uh, uh, be in communication with him to find out what he thinks now, but it's very clear. And here we have an example of style gangs, one of the um, the early forms of generative adversarial networks that were responsible for opening up a huge, um, a, a huge, a huge area of exploration. Um, they were um, uh, conceptualized by Ian Goodfellow in 2014, and since then there's been a whole zoo of different GANs out there. And they initially they work with uh, human faces, partly because um, uh, there was so much data available on the internet, uh, so many faces, these are kind of Hollywood kind of faces in some ways. And um, and also that they're symmetrical to some extent, so therefore they're easier than, than, than other forms. And very soon they developed through progressive GANs into, into style GANs, and now there's a second version of style GANs where they are really very, very convincing. And I should point out that these are these are um, these are faces of, of human beings that do not yet do not exist. So the idea that uh, Watanabe was commenting on that's clearly false. Uh, computers can dream of images that do not yet exist. In fact, there is a website you can go to. This person does not exist. Where you can um, every time you refresh your browser, you will come up with a with a face that is absolutely convincing, entirely convincing. And of course. That is, opens up in another area of, to be worried about the idea of, of, of fake images that are generated by AI. Um, and more recently also, uh, there's been research going on in architecture. This is the work of Comp Himmelblau, um, Deep Himmelblau, that is probably at the moment the kind of the leading cutting edge of what we can do in terms of hallucinating buildings. Um, this is, I mean, uh, Wolf Pricks, uh, who is the CEO of, of Comp Himmelblau, has of course been a very progressive designer over the years and was very much part of the decon movement, but now it's AI that is capturing his imagination. And this is work, I should say, that has been uh, masterminded by Daniel Bolajan, who is um, behind this. Um, Daniel himself is, a, is now teaching at uh, uh, Florida Atlantic University, and he's one of the great minds out there. So this is really what is, um, and this is, of course, what some of this work is going to be on the front cover of the AD. This is the state of the art, as it were, um, of AI at the moment. Uh, it is at present just um, uh, of the applications of AI in architecture. It is simply 2D images, but now Daniel's developing work that's moving it into 3D. There are others, of course, that are involved, but I would say that this is the <clears throat> this is the most significant work that's coming out. Um, and Daniel himself is also involved in in uh, um, his own research, um, looking at how you can. He's using cycle GANs where you use two unpaired data sets, which opens up the possibilities because instead of interpolating things based on a existing data set, you can now extrapolate, as it were, breed by pairing off these two logics against one another. And this is a study of his um, of uh, that is taking both the Sagrada Familia in, in, uh, in uh, the church in, in by Gaudi in, in, in Barcelona, but pairing that up with a walk through the forest, um, which opens up the possibilities and, and, and generates an entirely new speculation. Here you can see those images of the forest itself um, that uh, are, are paired up against the, the, the data set of, of this. So at the moment, the research is ongoing and it's, it's, it's developing very, very quickly um, uh, in this area. Um, um, there's a huge fascination, I would say, going on in architecture right now about AI. It's having a significant impact on all forms of production, not just in offices, but also in schools of architecture. Um, let me show you a little another <clears throat> video since we're focusing a little on the UK. This is um, this is the work of Memo Acton, who's now back in Turkey, but he was uh, he's uh, he's just completing his um, PhD in uh, Goldsmiths in London, 
Um, and this is some of his work where he's um, looking at how a neural network can be trained on, on a data, different data sets and start interpreting the world through the lens of those data sets. So on the left-hand side, you can see his kind of keys and his charges and so on. And the right-hand side, there's clearly a network based on, 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 on flowers. And now we can see <clears throat> on the ocean um, that is kind of interpreting whatever images there is on the left and seeing it um, and, and hallucinating a, a kind of version of that. Um, so and then, and then we get his hand and fire and so on. Um, and this work, which is, I mean, Memo, I should say, is, is highly significant because not only is he a, 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 I mean, a fantastic artist, but he is computationally very, very advanced. Um, so, um, and this work inspired some of the work of my own students at Florida International University. Um, in this case, one of my students, Fernando Salcedo, um, is, uh, has trained a neural network on um, one of the buildings by Zahadid Architects, a research center in Saudi Arabia. And you feed in thousands and thousands of images um, to form this kind of database. And then using here, again, cycle GANs to try and look at how you might begin to interpret the, the image on the left, which is basically Fernando's wardrobe, his T-shirts, through the lens of these neural networks and start hallucinating um, possibilities. And the, and the second study that he did was, uh, was taking a more generic form of, of of architecture downtown Miami, and then his wardrobe again, his tie here becomes a, a, a tower block and so on. So these kind of ideas are just fascinating my students uh, at any rate. Um, we work with AI in the studio, uh, in the, my theory seminars, we, we talk about AI. And I mean, in the last few years, I've been talking more generally about computational theory. <clears throat> and um, I would say that 90% or 95% of my students end up writing about AI. So we're just, we're just focusing on AI these days. So it's just that. And they, it is the, the debate um, the, of, of today. They are absolutely fascinated in this. This is the AI generation. By the end of the decade, everyone will be, will be using AI. Everyone will be talking about AI. Every single school of architecture throughout the world will be teaching AI in one form or another. This is going to be the complete game changer in every aspect of life. Um, and so to some of my other more and more kind of straightforward level, but still interesting in many ways, um, a, a studio where, um, again, using cycle GANs, uh, uh, my student Ligia from Brazil has been exploring how it can open up a kind of different forms of expression. Um, and again, they're completely fascinated. All of a sudden, it's almost magical what they can produce, and this is really captivating their imagination. And I'm sure that it's captivating others throughout the world. Um, then uh, my student Maria, um, who uh, went to the, has taken some images from the Grand Canyon and is hallucinating other possible Grand Canyons. In each case, of course, it's um, it's these things don't exist. They are they are hallucinated. They are kind of based on this data set. And in this case, it's in style GANs. They are interpolated based on the, on the images in that data set. Um, but fascinating work. Um, and then Mario, another student in my from my uh, studio last year, um, again using uh, uh, style GANs and opening up the possibility of what could happen. Um, and just, it's in many ways for them, it's, I think it's a mind blowing development. This is how architecture suddenly gets injected with a, a new lease of life. Um, my colleague, Matthias Del Campo talks about it as the first genuinely 21st century design technique that's been introduced. And it is transforming schools um, all over the world. Some schools, of course, more than others. Um, uh, so I want to focus now, and this is really the main subject I want to talk about, um, um, uh, uh, the question about AlphaGo and what architects can learn about AlphaGo, how AlphaGo is going to, or either ideas behind AlphaGo are going to be informing the future of architecture. So AlphaGo, um, following on from 1997 when um, Deep Blue, um, <clears throat> which is an IBM computer, <clears throat> excuse me, um, beat um, Gary Kasparov at chess, uh, the next challenge, it seemed, was the game of Go. But as a, go, a, a, a challenge which was infinitely more um, uh, um, challenging, or the, the, whole, the task was infinitely more challenging than chess. There are more moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. 
and it becomes hugely complex. So whereas whereas in the game of uh, in the in, in chess, Deep Blue was was literally trained on every single possible game. It was kind of like it was fed all this information. It was it was trained by playing against human experts and so on. You couldn't do this with Go. You had to have a different system that would be more efficient. So we moved from expert systems, which is basically from program systems to learning systems. Systems could learn by themselves. And all of a sudden, this opened up. And of course, as with Gary Kasparov, nobody thought that Lisa Doll was going to lose to AI. Um, no one thought that at all. Um, and there is a fabulous um, uh, Netflix documentary on this, which is really informative, and I would recommend it. But let me just play you the trailer for it, because I think it's kind of, in, in, it's for all sorts of reasons, it's kind of instructive. Go is the world's oldest continuously played board game. It is one of the simplest and also most abstract. Beating a professional player at Go is a long-standing challenge of artificial intelligence. Everything we've ever tried in AI just falls over when you try the game of Go. The number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. AlphaGo found a way to learn how to play Go. So far, AlphaGo has beaten every challenge we've given it, but we won't know its true strength until we play somebody who is at the top of the world, like Lisa Dahl. Not like no other is about to get underway in South Korea. Lisa Dahl is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Just the very thought of a machine playing a human is inherently intriguing. The place is a madhouse. Welcome to the Deep Mind Challenge for Worlds watching. Can Lisa Dahl find AlphaGo's weakness? Ooh. Whoa. Is there, in fact, a weakness? The game kind of turned on its axis. Look at his face. That is not a confident face. It's developing into a very, very dangerous fight. Ooh, hold the phone. Three is left to roll. In the end, it is about pride. I hate this having a drop. Yeah, it's made in the tech. It's got to be a career. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to drive our future. This is it, folks. So just to clarify, um, <clears throat> DeepMind, who produced AlphaGo, is a company based in London, run by Dennis Hosavis, and um, it's now owned by Google, um, but it's continuing to be a, a really significant player in the domain of, of, of AI. I want to pick out on one, <clears throat> one particular comment that came out of that trailer. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to drive our future. That proved to be incredibly prescient. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to be driving, are going to drive our future. <clears throat> there was one particular move in the match which really startled everyone. Uh, it was in game two and it's move 37 that has now become super famous, super famous. And I don't play Go, right? I never played Go in my life. But this is the move and it means nothing to me, but it absolutely shocked Go experts throughout the world because it was a move that had never been made before. And at first, they thought it was a computer glitch. They thought that was just stupid. Why make that move? And then a, th a few moves down the line, they realized the strategic brilliance of the move. And, so, and since then, this has not only changed the game of Go forever, but has had major repercussions throughout the world. Um, this is the comment. There was actually an exhibition, um, AI More Than Human, um, at the Barbican in 2019, um, where they were talking about these things again, a fantastic exhibition. And the comment of Lisa Doll after game two, yesterday I was surprised, but today I am speechless. And <clears throat> so this move, which is... Um, it's gone down in history as, as, as being so significant. And Fan Hui, who was a, a, the European champion at Go, who was commenting on the match, um, made this comment um, about uh, Lisa Dole recognizing that AlphaGo was creative. I, I mean, I would question actually whether, whether, whether computers can be creative as such. And certainly Melanie Mitchell has the view that you have to be conscious of what you've done to appreciate the fact that it is creative. But nonetheless, he uses the term creative, but perhaps more significantly, um, 
uh, uh, Lisa Doll comments, AlphaGo showed us that moves human beings may have thought are creative were actually conventional. Um, well, again, I'm not sure that humans are quite as creative as, they like, as we like to think ourselves are being. But certainly what this points out is the way in which you know, AlphaGo was operating at a different level, way beyond even what humans can think about. And the point being, this was just a series, one of a series of what have been described as smart moves, oh, sorry, slack moves. There were a series of slack moves which experts at the time didn't, realized, didn't recognize, uh, or, or again, thought they were computer glitches. And it was only later on that they realized that the brilliance, the strategic brilliance of these moves, because we simply couldn't conceptualize the complexity of the operation. We couldn't imagine that possibility beforehand. There was a, it was a very sophisticated operation. There were a number of ne three different networks that have been used in this, a policy network, a neuron a value network, and a Monte Carlo tree search. And this was an incredibly intense operation. And they managed to come up with these absolutely brilliant moves that that no human could even understand, let alone conceptualize. And that's the point, is it was beyond the capacity of human beings even to imagine. We couldn't even imagine it. And as such, you know, if you're, you, you, you're ignorant about anything you don't know about, right? So you, it was way beyond the capacity of human beings. Um, I want to go back to um, a, a comment that was made by Alan Turing, which when I first read it, I thought it was kind of perverse in many ways. And he was speculating about how whether computers could um, could be creative. And, uh, and he makes this comment. I don't think we can draw the line with sonnets. They could produce sonnets. But then he makes this kind of weird comment. But the, but the, the comparison is perhaps a little unfair because a sonnet written by a machine will be better appreciated by another machine. Um, and I thought, what does he mean by that? And well, first of all, I, I think probably it necessary. I mean, if you're not conscious, you can't appreciate something. So probably that is not he's not correct as such. But the point being that 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 potentially computers can operate at a level that we simply cannot understand because it's way beyond our comprehension. And I think that itself is absolutely correct from that point of view. <clears throat> in this kind of big debate that was going on a couple of years ago between Jack Ma and Elon Musk, uh, I'm completely on the side of Elon Musk. Jack Ma uh, takes a, what is, I guess, a, a fairly traditional kind of viewpoint. I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than human beings. Um, I mean, that is so wrong, right? And, and Elon Musk, who is at the heart of AI, because not only is he using AI for SpaceX, but also um, he's been part of, um, uh, of uh, um, te well, Tesla is integral to the whole, AI is integral to, to, to Tesla and so on and so on and so on. He uses AI throughout and he's very familiar with these cutting edge things. He's also, and he's, 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 he's involved in the very cutting edge of AI development. Um, and he says, I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is uh, to assume they're smart. People underestimate the capability of, the capability of AI. Um, they sort of think it's a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. And I think this is absolutely, absolutely on the ball. That's exactly what we've got to understand. And we are not even going to understand how smart it is because it's beyond our range of understanding. Uh, the, the match had a huge significance around the world, um, not least because uh, of its impact on, 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 on uh, beyond AI itself, itself or beyond AI culture. Uh, Kai-Fu Lee, who's one of the world's experts on AI, um, uh, wrote a book called AI Superpowers, um, where he compares um, China to Silicon Valley and, and uh, he points out that this match itself had a vast impact on China. Now, in the West, in 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 in, in Europe, we don't play Go, we play chess and things, so it didn't really mean much to us. But to a nation such as China, you know, as where for whom it's a national game, and it, this match was watched by millions of people. This had a huge impact on it. And in fact, Kai Fu Lee goes on to describe it as a, like a the Sputnik moment. Um, now, Sputnik, for those of you unaware, this was a Russian satellite that was um, launched in 1957, I think it was, and it so shocked 
America that in the space race because Russia had leapt ahead and done something the Americans hadn't done. This is what galvanized them and got them to 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 um, to, to launch NASA. Sputnik, the Sputnik moment led to the foundation of NASA, and the Sputnik moment in terms of AI for China led this huge investment. Uh, President Xi in 2017 um, uh, 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 announced that they were going to kind of invest in AI in a huge way. Um, not only that, but also Korea, that was Seoul was hosting the map, match, they also decided to invest in that. And just to kind of put this in context, um, Vladimir Putin has made the comment, whoever controls AI, leads an AI leads the world. I mean, it is it is the significant uh, uh, game changer in our world today. There's absolutely no question about it. And why is it the game changer? There are many different reasons. One is the fact that we've got vastly improved algorithms. Secondly, we can use cloud computing and therefore connect with GPUs. Thirdly, we have much, much great, huge amount of data that are available. In the last two years, more data has been produced than the entire history. Um, and and there are vast, there's huge investment going to it. There, there are uh, way more uh, uh, students using computers, using AI, and that applies not just to computer scientists, but also to architects as well. Um, so, and of course, it's not just in China. It's also in 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 the states as well. Open AI is, I mean, what GPT three has achieved is absolutely astonishing. And uh, um, uh, and I think that uh, um, we might hear from my mystery about about Clip and 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 Dali two um, uh, like, uh, uh, image generating uh, uh, net programs that have come out of, of um, GPT three, but it's had a huge huge significance. So the question really that has to be asked is, will the ideas that are driving AlphaGo also drive the future of architecture? Actually, I, I think that's probably the wrong question because the point is they are already driving the, the, the future of architecture. The ideas that are driving AlphaGo are already driving the future of architecture. And I want to just point out why that is. I mean, first of all, I showed you some... Um, speculative designs that have been produced by Cor Pimmelblau, by uh, Daniel Bolajan, by some of my students, and there are all many examples all over the world now. It's become a kind of hot topic in, in design studios. Um, and the use of GANs, especially in terms of hallucinating images, has been really extremely popular. I see it a lot in SciArc, for example. Um, I know that Matthias is pushing this in, in Michigan and, and so on. You know, my students do it, right? But I want to draw a distinction between what I would call urban design and urban planning, or rather use that example. In other words, when we're thinking about design, actually there's, there are two sides of it in many ways. One is the strategic uh, um, planning, you know, in terms of the kind of massing models and more kind of... Um, uh, uh, conceptual planning of, the, of, of that's going on. And then there's the, the design itself, which is more about the aesthetics, more about what it looks like. And what I showed you early on is really to do with maybe appearances about aesthetics, but it is the urban planning side of things, the strategic side of things, where I think AI is going to be absolutely a game changer. And there's no question about it. It might just be that the kind of fad for, for GANs in schools of architecture fades after a while and we move on to the next thing. But in terms of, urban, of, of, of strategic planning, I've got no doubt that it's going to be the case. So one of the people I've involved in some of my discussions on digital futures has been Harvard Hochland, who is uh, the CEO of Spacemaker AI that was snapped up by um, by Google um, <clears throat> last year for, um, or was it this year, um, for $240 million. Um, so not Google, um, um, uh, by Autodesk. Um, and Autodesk, they realized that AI, Autodesk actually are quite far behind actually in terms of AI despite what they claim. Um, but anyway, they could recognize the possibility of this. And what was interesting from the conversations with Harvard Hochland is when he pointed out um, some of the observations that were coming in. Now, this is the kind of work they've been involved in. And of course, mm -hmm. It's in terms of architectural style, it's pretty kind of conventional. It's not bad kind of modernist architecture, but there's nothing outrageously about this. But what is interesting is the process by which they, they generate these particular forms and they're using kind of um, a forms, a computational modeling. In fact, I suspect this is probably um, one of uh, Theodorus' um, uh, software <clears throat> that he's developed, um, testing out the site according to um, in this case, um, uh, uh, thermal comfort conditions and so on. Um, but what's interesting is, it, but what was really interesting about this was not the process, 
but the fact that they were surprised by some of the outcomes that are coming up. Again, something pretty conventional from an aesthetic point of view, this particular project, nothing outrageous and kind of conventional. But what's happening is that it's, it's, it, it's dealing with this, the, 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 um, the vast data that one has to deal with in urban planning and coming up with strategic solutions that we would never have imagined. Not only we'd never have imagined, but actually they're kind of counterintuitive. I mean, this is the point, basically, is that, is we, that human beings have got a, a limit to what they can deal with, um, and, and urban conditions, the kind of uh, situations in urban planning that you deal with, are vastly more complex than anything that we ourselves can conceptualize, and this is where computers are so incredibly more powerful than we are. And this is a comment that I think that I, you know, um, I, I, it came out of our conversation, but it just struck me. This is absolutely astonishing. Um, and he refers to one particular project they call the Giraffe Project for some reason. But anyway, <clears throat> the places where the architects thought it would be smart to build tall buildings and the places where they thought it would be smart to build a dense wall, all the things they, that they thought intuitively would be smart because they had hundreds of projects of experience were flipped around. So what happened was that the computer was able to find a pattern as to how to solve that site that you would never have come up with yourself. It simp the conditions are too complex for humans to actually deal with, and things that we thought we knew about were flipped around, and the computer came up with, su with, with, with suggestions that actually made a lot of sense but were completely different to what we ourselves might have imagined. And this goes back to this kind of this, this game of Go, which is also essentially strategic. It's not about aesthetics, it's about strategy. AlphaGo showed us that moves, humans might have thought were creative, were actually conventional. Um, so there's a direct parallel that's been drawn here between the kind of the way that AlphaGo is operating and the way that, um, that, that uh, uh, um, SpaceMaker AI operates. And this is the second comment that, he, that, that, that uh, Hochland makes, which I think is really significant. Developers really want architects to use SpaceMaker. It is a requirement from, the, from their clients. Why is this the case? Well, because clients want to guarantee the maximum ROI, return on investment, they want to get the maximum profits from their, from their site, they want to make sure their buildings are performing as well as possible, um, according to the work, the work, the, the software that, that, that uh, Theodorus is producing and so on, they want to use AI to guarantee the maximum feedback on their on their, their projects. This is going to be the game change. This is going to be the game change, and not the kind of funky aesthetics you get. It's going to be this. Clients are going to insist on this, and what's going to happen as a basis of that is, of course, that architects are start going to be branding themselves. I'm using AI more than you just as they are at the moment in terms of sustainability. I'm more sustainable than you, I'm more LEED certified or whatever the word is term in the UK is. And of course, so that is gonna be the driver of, of, um, of change. And then they make this comment, which I don't think necessarily, it's not quite gonna happen that way. We firmly believe that in the workplace of the future, architects using AI will replace architects that don't. I don't think it's gonna be a sudden moment when they kind of sack all the architects who aren't using AI and they bring in a whole new team that are using AI. I think that what's gonna happen is AI is gonna start infiltrating, and it already is, infiltrating the office so that everybody's effectively using AI. It's, it's, it, it's, it's gonna be a, um, you have to use AI. There's gonna be no, no other way Clients are going to insist on that, and it'll gradually be creeping up in a way. And I think the description of somehow of the idea of a kind of a, I never, uh, of, of boiling a frog, not that I've boiled a frog, not that I would ever want to recommend anyone boils a frog, but the idea that, you know, if you put a frog in boiling water, it would jump out. <clears throat> but if you gradually put it in tepid water and gradually increase the heat, the frog won't notice. And I think this is the point, that, that what the way that it's going to infiltrate architectural culture is going to be incremental in a way that we don't really notice, but eventually it'll be there. Just as with a Tesla self-driving car, it's through software updates that you gradually reach the point where you are, you have a self-driving car. It's not a sudden explosion. It's not a sudden revolution. It's a gradual kind of process. Uh, another one of my uh, uh, deep uh, Doctor Design can Doctor of Design candidates, along with uh, Theodorus, is Wan Yuhe, who is the um, CEO of X Cool in 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 China. X Cool is um, 
Well, when you used to work for uh, Rem Koolhaas, OMA, X Cool means X Koolhaas. It's also, in, in, according to the um, Urban Dictionary, is, a, is a, an expression for super hyper cool. Um, and when you actually is, 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 is an example of someone who, in fact, their work is way more progressive than Space Maker AI. They're, they're using deep learning in a way that they, they simply don't do in, 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 with um, uh, uh, Space Maker. But what, the, what she was struck by was um, not AlphaGo, but the next generation, um, AlphaGo Zero. And of course, we don't know about AlphaGo Zero so much because uh, AlphaGo was, was a subject of a documentary. Uh, it, it was on everyone's um, uh, everyone was aware of it. AlphaGo Zero, I mean, actually, AlphaGo played Lisa Doll, who wasn't the world champion. He was a very uh, highly ranked player. But AlphaGo Zero played the world champion and thrashed and thrashed that person. And the point about AlphaGo Zero, the significant move, the thing about AlphaGo Zero is that it completely taught itself to play to play Go without any um, instructions about the rules. It learned the rules through a process involving reinforcement learning, which is one of the techniques of how you train deep learning AI. And, and the point about this is actually the sheer scale of operations. Um, AlphaGo Zero played I think it was 3.9 million games of Go against itself over a period of three days. Whatever it was, it, it comes out, the, 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 actual, the, the speed of it was actually 20 games of Go a second. 20 games of Go a second. Now, we can't even imagine it. We just simply cannot even imagine that kind of rate of playing Go, just as we can't imagine the possibilities of, game, of, of move 37 in, in, game, in game two. This is the point about AI, is that it simply is beyond our comprehension. It is you know, blowing us away with what it can do. And now we're getting this kind of situation where this is feeding into architecture. It was AlphaGo Zero more than AlphaGo that actually fed into XCool, and then they incorporated this into their, their process. This is the, the app, which you, of course you access via the cloud, therefore you don't need your own GPUs. And, and this is an example I showed you earlier on of um, uh, the, 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 the StyleGAN um, video, uh, this person does not exist. This is the, a similar version um, produced by Xcool. This building does not exist. And for a while they had this um, hosted on their website and you could generate thousands of thousands of different buildings. Um, this is um, StyleGAN, therefore it's interpolating rather than extrapolating. So it's limited by the data set that you give it, but nonetheless it can give you any number of variations in terms of uh, according to what you have um, inputted in terms of the data. And of course, the problem about this, though, although it appears to be 3D, it's only 2D. Um, anyway, and these are some of the still images that came out of it. Um, uh, not perfect in many ways, but as uh, with deep learning, the, the more you you um, you use it, the better it gets. As as anybody who's has been using the, the translation apps on, on on WeChat will know, it gets better <clears throat> better over time, um, and it gets more and more refined. Um, sorry, Neil. Sorry for interrupting. I think we might be a bit short on time. Okay, let me let me just yeah. finish up then. Okay, so just uh, in very quickly, the AI in the future of architecture. Um, I want to say suggest that it's not just AlphaGo that we need to think about it's, uh, in terms of the future of architecture. It's also uh, the the self driving car. Um, and um, uh, this is the kind of comment that came actually. Toby Walsh is also from the UK, um, and he makes the prediction that we will not be allowed to drive our cars anymore. Why does he say this? He's basically saying that um, uh, over time, we will get so used to using self-driving cars that they'll be more convenient and we will stop driving ourselves. Not only that, because we stop driving so much ourselves, we will lose those, lose those driving skills and it will mean, mean that the insurance premiums will, will go up. And in the end, we won't bother. When, and he points, we will not even notice or care. Driving will disappear in a way that many other things have disappeared over, over time. Um, the question I, I would ask is, we won't be able to design buildings anymore. This is going to apply to architecture. As increasingly clients are insisting that, they, that, that architects use AI, why even use an architect when buildings when our AI is able to, to um, develop um, buildings completely autonomously according to your own particular preferences? So the next book I'm going to be working on is called The Death of the Architect, The Demise of the Architectural Profession in the Age of AI, that is predicting that a, an architectural profession that's already struggling will effectively be um, under strain from um, the, the impact of AI. 
So the question is, in, in 1972, there was this very famous book, Learning from Las Vegas, that transforms that sort of transformed um, the world of architecture. Um, I think a much more significant thing is going to happen in by 2022, which is going to be the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary of Learning from Las Vegas. I think we should be thinking about what we can learn from AlphaGo, what we can learn from AI, because these are the ideas that are really driving the future of architecture. So I'll stop sharing here and end it now. My apologies for running over time. I thought I was going to be shorter than that. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Neil. That was really insightful and incredible research from your PhD students. Um, beyond just from what I saw from Theodore this morning, there's so much more um, to be seen, obviously. <laughs> just quite incredible. Um, there's a couple of questions from the q and I think we have a little bit of time. Um, so the first one says, um, sounds like not all practices are welcoming AI with open arms. Do you feel like architecture as an industry compared to others has been slow to accept AI? And if so, why? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, like I say I studied at Cambridge, right? And and in the eighties, when when kind of like computers came in, and frankly, there was huge opposition in Cambridge to computers, huge opposition, um, and uh, it was actually banned from the studio. Um, and what happened was there was a whole generation of architects who came out who were simply unemployable because they couldn't have the necessary skills. So, you know, I can see that again. Um, and I can see that, you know, I don't know why that is. I mean, I actually just recently I, I was going to I floated a, um, a, a book title to MIT Press and the guy in charge said, he said, I'm not interested in those kind of things. And there is resistance, absolute resistance. And strangely, from the world of history and theory, I don't know why that is. I don't know. What, so I would say, yes, there's, and there's bound to be resistance. I think they were literally, that resistance will die off because you can't, you can't survive without it. So, you know, um, why are architects like that? Well, I think, I mean, okay, my view is that the architects, they think they're future thinking, but they're not. Um, and, I mean, the, the idea of the future of architects, most people think, think in terms of, think of the future of the profession in terms of kind of the latest style or something. We've got to step beyond that and really think strategically about how the office of the future will operate. We are not as future thinking as we, we, we should be. If any school of architecture, you know, you're, there are hundreds of courses on the history of architecture. I know none on the future of architecture. Um, so I would say, yes, I mean, we can anticipate a, a lot of resistance and we can anticipate that that resistance will eventually die out, that'd be my opinion. I think so. And I think if there's so much resistance in industry, I'm sorry, in academia, then of course that's reflected into industry. Yeah, but, I think the, care, <laughs> but, but the key thing is when clients say, I want this, I mean, you know, you, you, you literally have got to, got to pay attention to that. And um, otherwise you'll be left behind by history. Um, yeah. And um, there's a second question as well that I'll get through quickly. Um, think about your exploration in generative AI. In the future, do you foresee architects delegating a lot of conceptual form binding to AI and a shift in our day-to-day -to -day towards being an evaluator of the outputs in human terms? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, no, that's that's already happening. I think. You know, um, uh, no, but to my mind, the crucial question is, is to what extent you, you, you reach the point where you think, well, hold on a second, this is a machine that can do this all for me. Why do I need an architect? Um, and, you know, just to, I want to say something that is to say that when I was a student, when I was in your stage, you know, at, at Cambridge, you know, that was a different world. We, you know, I'd go on holiday and I would I would go to a travel agent and I would sit down in a queue and SDA travel or something and, and, and wait to talk to a, an agent and they would book my flight and, and, and so on. Um, uh, these days. I just go online. I don't know if there are any travel agents around. I would also would go to a camera shop and I would I would um, buy a roll of film or several rolls of film that I take with me. Then I'd come back and I'd get them developed. And actually, there are no film developers anymore because we because we we, we everything is we. In fact, there are very few camera shops because all phones have cameras. So the idea that somehow you can expect one particular trade to carry on forever. Um, is is a myth, and we as architects have got to be aware of that because you know, frankly, um, there are things doing things better than us. Um, so we can't guarantee that we ourselves will be around in a few years' time. So that's the the kind of sinister message in, in, in my next book is to say we need to wake up to this, you know. And I think I'm astonished by how little awareness there is in, arch in architectural culture of these things happening. And you know, anyway, but uh, that's a long debate. Look forward to diving into that deeper in the in the panel. 
Um, I'm going to pass on to Vinay now uh, for his section. That's all right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sure. Thank you, Georgina. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Um, so hello, uh, my name is uh, Vinay Zakaria, and I am a master's student at the WSA Computational Methods and Architecture course. And I will be your co-host for the evening. So we have a few minutes which we would put for the next segment, that is the um, WSA Awards. So, and after which we will break for maybe five to 10 minutes. And at 7.30, we would hope we are hoping to start the panel discussion on the future of architecture and computation. So um, the WSA awards were introduced this year, and tonight we will be presenting the winning projects for the Computational Innovation Awards. The awards are sponsored, and the winning projects were selected by Gianni Bosford Architects. So a huge thanks to them. And so the first honorable mention for the Computation and Innovation Award goes to Down the River by Jonathan Benesik. I hope you're pr um, pronouncing the name right. So a huge congratulations to Jonathan. His pro project entirely focuses on tackling the complex issues of solar form and its influence in a city. The judges commented Jonathan's use of existing computational tools and how he extended their reach through intelligent applications for understanding and applying it to the surrounding context. So Jonathan, if you're here with us, would you like to take maybe a quick one or two minutes to showcase your project and talk a bit about it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen then. So um, yeah, I thought rather than uh, tell you all about the project um, as a whole, uh, which you can find on the um, exhibition website, uh, either and by unit or by theme, um, I'll just go into explicitly how I used computation in my project um, and what ideas I tried to glean from that. So mine was all about essentially bringing the environment into the city and ways that people can capture part of the natural environment of Cardiff. Um, so I started by isolating a single moment that I observed while I was um, conducting site research. And that was the, um, the way in which light could dance on a wall next to the river and the way that water reflected that light. And so I was trying to deconstruct all those elements and, and reasons why that effect occurred. Um, and then once I had understood each of the parameters, i.e. The, the shade and the reflection and the, the, the way that the surface was angled, um, I could then map sunlight across that river um, using grasshopper and ladybug. Um, and I could uh, isolate the areas of the most, um, the, the most intense areas of the river that receive the most sunlight. Um, and I could uh, apply the same set of rules in um, producing areas of shade and areas of reflection on that patch of water to generate a volume that was able to capture all of these different phenomena. Um, that led to some initial examples. Um, so this, this is a diagram that illustrates what's happening in the script. And that generated an initial form, something like this, which uh, as um, Neil said earlier, is something that, that I could never conceive um, when I'm designing, you know, as a human, but this is what the, um, the script was able to produce for me. And then, so that was looking at direct sunlight and then reflected off the surface of the water. You can start to produce these kinds of forms. Um, but this was uh, entirely based on um, if I was to produce a form on the surface of the river to capture this moment. But then I thought about bringing this wider and into the context of the city um, and, uh, and how to bring this effect through the city. And as you can see, if you um, extrude the, this reflected sunlight through and elevate it at different um, levels, you can start to bring the light all the way through the city. And so these are selected times where the angle of the sun is such that it reflects off the water and could reflect 
through these parts of the city and the, the red buildings illustrate those buildings affected. Um, so I used uh, as part as my overall um, project because I, you know, the, the masters is only so long, so I couldn't unfortunately um, seek out all avenues. I focused on one particular path as a case study to what could be seen as a placemaking in the city or as sort of a reconnection um, or even a sort of um, kind of celebration of, um, of nature um, and take one isolated moment and, uh, and cut it through and see what that looks like. And that starts to generate uh, this. So this is um, uh, essentially the final proposition, which is a cut through of all the buildings. And then I've uh, provided scaffolding to the, uh, to the for structural support and sort of realizing what would happen logistically um, if this were to occur. So that is what my project is about. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, unfortunately, we are a bit short of time, so I would have taken questions from the audiences for your project. But so going on to the next honorable mention is for Grove Garden Dwellings by Lawrence Lynch. So a huge congratulations to Lawrence. Um, and the judges especially commented Lawrence's methodical approach and clear thinking and how that led to new solutions in architecture. So Lawrence, would you like to take a quick one or two minutes to showcase the project? Yeah, I'll try and be as brief as I, as I can. Yeah, uh, yeah so Grave Garden Dwellings uh, was focused on optimizing well-being within uh, high-rise residential buildings. Um, and high-rise buildings are associated with a lack of connection with nature a social isolation and an inhuman scale. And so my thesis aimed to explore how design can address this um, by creating a series of garden terraces max so that people have maximized views of nature and social connections between terraces. This was also informed by the research of uh, Yang Gel, uh, which demonstrates that social connections are broken beyond a five story limit. And so that would be the maximum distance between terraces. Um, in order to optimize uh, the distribution of terraces, I researched phylotaxis, uh, which describes the optimal distribution of leaves and plants to prevent overshadowing. Uh, Inspired by the work of John Edmark, uh, I explored how phylotactic towers of increasing complexity can cre be created by scaling and rotating layers by multiples of the golden angle. Um, I developed this further by creating a script which would allow me to distort and stretch the form so that the massing can be optimized to maximize the sun uh, reaching the terraces. And the script was developed so that a wide range of different forms and spirals um, can be created. Um, and the building was then uh, optimized based on the site and barking, uh, which overlooks the river roading. Uh, and so I used evolutionary optimization tools um, to maximize the sunlight reaching the terraces, whilst also optimizing the volume to surface area and the visual connection with the terraces. Uh, here you can see the, um, the massing on the site, uh, consisting of three towers, which form a central atrium. Um, and each tower was then sort of um, optimized in turn uh, for the, the shading between towers. And this is how it relates to the water so opening up towards the town key. Um, and this, this is just showing how the, the, the expression was developed based on um, biomorphic forms uh, and, and allowing the insertion of windows and facade planting. And this was a study uh, just showing how uh, you can create sort of uh, scalping garden terraces that overlook each other. It's all integrated. Um, the name barking is, is said to originate from the Anglo-Saxon for dwellers among the birch trees. Uh, this inspired the creation of a central atrium at the heart of the project, which evokes the feeling of dwelling amongst a lush grove of trees. Conceptually, each of the three towers is like a tree with balconies and floor plates cantilevering out from their respective cores or trunks. 
like the branches of a tree, the balconies and gardens are arranged to maximize exposure to the sun, so growing towards the light. Uh, inspired by the scalloping forms and banded layers of cockle shells, the form of the balconies are designed to catch the lights and emphasize the three-dimensionality. Uh, and the building is designed to be constructed from 3D printed concrete, uh, unitized facade panels, uh, which can adapt to the unique forms and be easily brought to site. Uh, from within the grove, it's possible to get a sense of the whole community, allowing residents to catch a glimpse of neighbors and views of life below. Uh, the central atrium also serves as a meeting place where neighbors might cross paths as they access the building. And that's, that's everything. Thanks a lot, Lawrence. Uh, that's a wonderful project. Uh, congratulations once again. And now to the um, winning project. So the winning project was Rewild the People by Georgina Meyer. So Georgina is one of our panelists. Uh, a huge congratulations to her. So the project looked at the larger scale cause of flooding in Cardiff using computational techniques. And then she developed a new rewilding approach further upstream that combines holistic thinking and the power of computation. So she broke down all the layers um, that influence the outcome of flooding, such as water flows, runoff, drainage, land use, slope analysis, and analyzed all of these factors using advanced programming and animation techniques. And she proposed a solution that would not have em emerged any other way. So Georgina, congratulations. Uh, would you like to take a quick few minutes to talk about your winning project. Thanks. Um, I'll be trying to be really, really quick so that we can have a little break in between. Um, so my project is We Wild People. So looking at soil quality and land use as parameters of flooding, I tried to use rewilding to retain water in the mountains to alleviate flooding along the length of the river, but also in the city itself. Um, this interest was kind of uh, brought about by uh, the primer that I did and looking at the relationships between what we can predict and what we can't in nature. So this is also using computational tools. So obviously you can predict things like where, where the sun is going to be and what angles and what forms it's going to take, but not, you know, what the weather is going to be like that day and how cloudy it might be. So you might not get those kind of solid forms at all. Um, and I kind of took this idea further into flooding. So how could we then connect ourselves um, to these wild systems um, and kind of reject the overbearing control that we have in the natural world. Um, so this map to the right is quite shocking, I find. Uh, this land projected to be under the flood level by 2050. The land is in dark blue below flood level, which is horrifying. Um, and the top kind of has my concept itself, where I worked, you know, going up from the city itself along the valleys all the way up um, into the mountains to look at where the best place was to intervene by rewilding. Um, and I found the mountains to kind of be the, the, the least explored area. Um, the, the main way I started analyzing it was through a series of kind of mapping exercises. So looking at the pliability, geology, land cover, and um, the urban areas and where flooding was put to a car, which is kind of in dark blue on this map. Um, and then I took the this information um, into software like Grasshopper and Houdini, where I simulated um, the paths that the water would travel across. So what land is actually going to get flooded and what land is able to absorb that water. Um, and then this is just an animation of uh, the water falling onto the land uh, based on the terrain and where it accumulates, which maps um, quite well to the actual flooding um, maps. Um, and then this is a more complex simulation because of the impact of permeability and the actual soil type on how badly flooding is actually affecting areas. Um, obviously, you can't do permeability in Houdini. Uh, so instead, I actually used magnetic forces um, where there was uh, more tightly packed soil to repel the water from those areas. So this kind of uh, produced an animation that was as close as possible as you could kind of get to mimicking what would actually happen. Quite interesting uh, using Houdini anyway. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the process and using the different masks on the different uh, particle layers. And then I kind of zoomed in a bit more to my site, um, analyzed the different kind of gradient types across the mountain um, 
and kind of created a set of rules because different areas of land cover are are not so good at absorbing water compared to others, depending on the slopes. So there's kind of a relationship there. And I developed a very wild and fun, and there's a video there which animates the, the progress of land over time, which is gone. Uh, but I also looked at things like um, uh, the, the wind analysis, looking at uh, how the terrain affected how seed may flow across the land for rewilding and also solar analysis. So where would, where would the trees best grow using things such as uh, ladybug and um, also I think it was an autodesk tool for the, for the uh, wind analysis. And then the final structure I created um, is this bridge which kind of um, juxtaposes the feelings of kind of excitement and fear and safety and shelter. So it's the idea of rewilding yourself um, so fully immersing yourself in the landscape, um, but being able to experience it in a way that kind of suits our, our modern uh, way of life. Uh, yeah, and this is, yeah, I, I do all my designs entirely in grasshopper, which is a bit odd maybe, but it, it works very well for me, <laughs> which probably influenced the form quite a bit. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing now so we can have a five minute break, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, sorry guys, we might have gone a bit over time. So maybe we can regroup at 7.30 or would you prefer it to be at 7.35? So I think 7.35 might be good. Uh, I guess so a quick eight minute break then. So we'll be back then for the panel. So stay tuned everyone. Hello everyone, and once again, welcome to our panel discussion on the future of architecture and computation as part of the Well School of Architecture Festival 2021. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. And I'll just introduce myself quickly again. My name is Vene Zakaria, and I'm a master's student at the WSA Computational Methods in Architecture course. And I will be co-chairing this panel today, along with Andrea here with us. Yeah, um, hello everyone. I am a well Vinay's classmate. I'm also a student at Computational Medicine Architecture at WSA, and I'm excited to be here and have a very interesting discussion today. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, as mentioned earlier, the topic for today is the future of architecture and computation. And with computation basically gaining interest among students and professionals, everyone is intrigued by the field and the future it holds in architecture. So, in today's panel, we intend to discuss the importance of computation in the future of architecture, as well as things like how the design process or how the roles of architects will change going forward. Um, well, in today's panel, we have six panelists. Some of you may have known from previously from today, um, but we have six from, Cart uh, sorry, three from Cardiff University. One is Georgina Myers. Um, she is a student at uh, Masters in Architecture at WSA. Uh, we also have two PhD candidates. We have Bill Lin and Abdul Rahman Alimani. And we have three uh, external panelists. One of them is Neil Leach, um, so, who most of you must have heard his incredible speech um, a few minutes ago. And he is a British architect, author, researcher, and lecturer. We have Mario Siriakos. He is an associate partner at the Applied Research and Development Group at uh, Foster and Partners. And we also have Mayur Mystery. Um, he's an architect and a design technologist at Perkins and Will. Now, um, at the beginning of the panel, we're going to start with three to five minutes introduction. So you can talk to us a little bit about your background and a small anecdote as to why you got interested in compositional architecture. Um, if anybody wants to start, you can just jump right in. And um, Mayur, do you want to start? Okay, I can go. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Mayur Mystery. So I started my journey as a civil engineer back in India. Then I worked as a structural engineer for a year at Bureau Hebel Engineering. At that time, I was uh, in back in 2018, I was first introduced to Grasshopper and the possibilities with it. Then uh, during the time at, uh, at my professional journey, I realized I have uh, aspiration for creativity and I want to study architecture. So I came to States to uh, to do a three-year program at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And uh, after, in my first year, I was doing uh, cable 
Doom uh, tensile structure design in Grasshopper, and we presented at a conference called IASS Barcelona, and then it did some uh, computational script development for deployable structures. And right at my second year, I was I was confused because uh, I didn't know there were like so many developments happening, and because of COVID, I wasn't sure about the things I want to be an expert, and I was about to drop out. But then I fortunately attended a uh, workshop at Digital Futures where I was exposed to AI. And that uh, again, like, gave me the immense potential AI has in the field of architecture. And then I, I developed some prototypes where I was using GAN. I did like text to image generation for a project for Native American housing design. And I also developed an app where you could do asset tracking in hospital and do segmentation and uh, other uh, database collection. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mayur. Uh, you go, Lynn. Oh, why don't you jump in? Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, um, I, I'm a, a WFS PhD uh, and uh, also I work in the Winter University as a lecturer. And uh, so um, the uh, very beginning, I, I know the uh, computations and innovations as when I uh, study my master in USA, UCL. And um, at that time, I think that is fascinating to me and uh, also, I remember in 2019 and I joined the um, uh, activity of the A summer school. And also uh, I, rem I remember I found some, there is uh, some research people uh, share about uh, the application of AI uh, in, the, uh, in the architectural design. So at that time I, I uh, focused on the research of AI uh, in urban design and architectural design. So after that, so I did some uh, academic project. So at that time, I did uh, I did a, re a project of urban um, research on digital uh, urban design based on AI. That is uh, a case of the North Extension of Central Green Access in Wenzhou. Uh, it's found um, also this is. Um, uh, 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 research. Uh, I'm the principal investigator of this research, and uh, 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 and also another research is uh, a, a project uh, research on wetland park planning and design based on the sewage treatment. That a case study of Sanyang Wetland Park, and um, uh, and also some uh, these project we uh, use some. Uh, some computation tools and use uh, uh, so AI tools. And also I published some uh, academic papers like uh, like urban space generative design based on AI like this. And also some, uh, I, did, I have done some practical uh, project. Uh, we also use uh, computation tools such as uh, uh, I joined the, uh, the project the old Wenzhou Urban, Urban Central Green Access Park and uh, Wenzhou Central Sewage Treatment Plant and Pavilion in Tampo Farming and Reading Cultural Garden like this. And also I have some teaching experience in uh, in in. Kent University and Wenzhou University. And in these uh, universities, I have some uh, supervision experience uh, for, the, for the master students and also for the, uh, uh, for the bachelor students. But we, we did some, I supervised some topic like uh, application of deep learning in urban image studies and application of AI in urban design and architectural design. So this all the thing is related. So my research of my, I mean, my PhD research is the exploration of potential use of AI in urban design. Okay, so that's all, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, Marius, do you wanna introduce yourself? 
Yeah, sorry, I was away for a bit. Um, I'm working with technology, but technology is constantly failing me. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Marius and um, originally an architect, um, but now I'm working as a design systems analyst um, at the Applied Research and Development Group at Foster and Partners. Um, which is a group that does all these things that happen in academia at the moment and have been happening for the past uh, years and and implements, in, implements them into real uh, life projects. Um, so applied computation is our, our main concern. Uh, we are a group of um, mainly architects, um, engineers, we have a UI, UX uh, designer, but uh, all of us have uh, one common thing. Um, we know how to uh, code and how to program software. So that's what we're doing for Foster and Partners. I mean, roughly 25% of our time is um, hands-on consultation on complex geometries, on analysis, et cetera. And the rest, 75%, we're building um, custom software solutions for the office. Um, um, this is part of our research and individually and as in our practice, we've been um, uh, Publishing a lot of papers, mainly in the domain of the um, computational design or CAD, as it was uh, in previous conferences. Um, at the same time, I'm very interested in generative geometry. And currently, like the past year, with uh, the current trend of uh, non fungible tokens and how things are being added to the blockchain, etc. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, Mario. Uh, Abdul Rahman. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdul Rahman Al Yamani. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree uh, from, uh, from Saudi Arabia in landscape architecture. And then I moved to USA and then I get uh, my master's degree in architecture in Mark, uh, at SIARC you know, uh, Institute for Architecture. Uh, in California around 2016. And I think at that time I met uh, Neil and uh, he was uh, a panel uh, in, in my dissertation. So <laughs> we met again now. So, uh, and then uh, now I'm doing my PhD uh, under uh, Wasim Jabi Supervision. Uh, I'm doing uh, uh, a graph machine learning uh, using uh, 3D topologic uh, uh, models. Uh, so the idea, I will give you like a brief idea of my uh, PhD. The idea is uh, uh, the relationship between building and ground. Uh, it's really hard uh, to uh, uh, recognize and, and understand uh, from one image. So uh, the, uh, these, I, uh, these problems uh, make me think about what if we uh, have a 3D topological model and we embedded uh, the graph theory inside these 3D models to uh, classify the relationship between the, the different relationship between building and ground. So this is the main uh, aspect of, of, of my uh, research. Uh, also, I published two different paper, which is related to our uh, uh, talk today, uh, which is uh, graph machine learning uh, using the, the 3D topologic model and the other one, architecture precedent uh, classification uh, using uh, uh, not image, not graph, using uh, uh, vector or uh, data uh, about uh, who built the building, like a president who built this uh, president, and then uh, try to find uh, overlapping between uh, uh, different uh, architects. Uh, 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 we find like a, a really astonishing, uh, like uh, there is uh, in, in our result, uh, there is overlap between Frank uh, Lloyd Wright and Miss van der Roy. In, in, in the approach of designing uh, the building into the ground. Even Le Corbusier has like a role in there. So uh, 
uh, to discover the overlap between the architect. I think this is the first step. It's really important step to understand uh, how the building ground uh, 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 develop uh, during uh, the uh, the history. Uh, yeah, this is uh, mainly about me and really happy to be with you. And uh, we discuss uh, uh, these kind of interesting topic and really unique uh, topic. Thank you very much, Abdul Rahman. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Neil, do you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, okay, so i just keep it brief. I mean, I studied in Cambridge. Um, actually, I studied under Dean Hawkes, who was the chair, I think, at uh, Cardiff a while back. But um, I, um, I guess my reason why I got into countries of computation was partly because um, I actually was a Latin translator, would you believe? And uh, in, in, in 88, I, we published this translation of Alberti. And, but I was working in the, in the, main, in the computer, because in those days you didn't have your own computers. You, you had your, we, I used the mainframe computer in, at the University of Cambridge. And um, I was uh, surrounded by these computational science students who were doing incredible things on the computer, amazing things. I was just blown away by what they could do. Um, and I also found that actually, even in translation, because there'd be, a few years before that, you would just type things, okay? And you typex things on a typewriter and you couldn't change it. And I began to realize that just the process of operating computationally, you could revise revise the translation again and again. And something new came out as a result of that process. Then alongside that, I guess I was um, influenced by, um, I was in a, in a negative way by some of the tutors at Cambridge who were telling us to read Heidegger. I know that Adam Shah was at uh, Cardiff for a while and uh, uh, is always championing Heidegger. Well, I, I produced a book called Forget Heidegger because I find him very, very conservative. So maybe there was this kind of Oedipal tendency to, to murder the father. And said, so as a student, I thought, okay, I want to challenge all these things. Um, so I think it came out of that. And I, I gradually began to realize that uh, this was actually a domain that was opening up new ways of thinking. I, I started teaching at Columbia and the AA where we're very, very progressive schools where the use of computers went alongside with progressive design. And, and I guess I'm not one of those kind of um, uh, kind of people who like, um, I mean, I don't mind Peter Zunter, but the guy, I think that architecture, I always, I'm interested in new things and how we can open up debates about things. So I guess it was the rebel in me as a young student that, that kind of, opened up these new avenues of exploration. Well, thank, thank you for that, Neil. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have lots to talk upon on the rest of the panel. And finally, we have our own uh, panelist, Georgina, a quick introduction, maybe. I'll keep it brief. Um, so I've just finished my master's at the World School of Architecture. Um, I've mainly been doing the project that I just presented. Uh, but the rest of the time I've been working um, on dissertation, which I'm now working on being published, um, looking at artificial creativity um, using the attention GAN model. Um, so looking at how descriptive words and atmospheric kind of descriptions of what space feels like could be translated into an actual visual representation of space and architecture. Um, I am just getting started in the world of um, artificial intelligence and design, um, intelligent design in general. Uh, I've only started looking into and actually using machine learning about a year ago now. Um, so I think I kind of bring the perspective of those wanting to understand and getting to this, you know, incredibly fascinating and in-depth world of computation. Thank you very much, uh, Georgina. Now, uh, we will start with the panel, and basically the panel is divided into three main topics. So we're going to talk about the past. Um, so how have past computational tools shaped today's architectural process? We're going to talk about the present, so how are current tools and methods transforming the industry? And also the future, how will future of machine learning, AI, lead design, and fabrication affect the whole of the architect and workforce? Um, now, one thing is that if anybody uh, throughout the panel has any other questions, you can just leave them in the Q&A and we will have a short Q&A portion at the end of the, of the panel. So, yep, thank you, Andrea. And let's start. So the first discussion will be on the past. So the, the main idea is, like Andre said, how have computational tools shaped today's architectural process? So maybe we can go to, like, at first, what made you interested in computational tools? Was it, like, maybe out of necessity or was it curiosity? 
And then are there like maybe tools which you were interested in before and by now they have no longer become relevant, you know? So are they like, are they still trying to be implemented now or will they be implemented in the future? So maybe we can have a discussion on how past tools, which are probably no longer rele irrelevant and the reason why it has become irrelevant. Maybe anyone would like to start off with an experience or topic or story. Maybe I know because I probably have the, I'm probably the oldest one here. I'm sure, um, but maybe I could just go back as it start chronologically. I mean, I was actually when I was a student at Cambridge, of course, the computers weren't there, um, and we were using these parallel motion drawing machines, um, um, and that that had a significant sort of uh, impact on 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 how we would do things. I mean, so I you know I think that we have to think about tools in terms of their affordances. In other words. They don't force you to do anything, but you can do certain things with certain tools and therefore somehow you end up doing more. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things about parallel motions is that it, therefore you had parallel buildings, um, sort of. I mean, not necessarily sort of. I mean, you. so it encouraged the use of rectilinearity. Now, in those days, we had these things called... Um, uh, French curves, which kind of you you could describe, you know, you could draw a beautiful curve, no question. The trouble is you had no idea what you were drawing and, and you couldn't define it. And I think this was, goes back to the kind of the question of how the Sydney Opera House was um, was designed. I mean, the, you probably know that Jorn Utzon did this beautiful sketch of these kind of billowing sails, as it were. And then the engineer said, well, how do we build this? We don't even know what you've drawn. And, and so in the end, they, they, they reduced it down to segments of a sphere so they could define it and analyze it and so on. So in a way, what the point is that once you started developing these um, tools, um, uh, is that what you use computations, you could start defining the curves that you were drawing. Um, and and that allowed you to really know what it was you're doing. So that was the, that was the significant significant shift. Um, uh, so you started off with kind of you know parametric tools like Katia, um, and, and that allowed you to kind of, and then to modify the curve in in a certain way. Uh, digital product came out of that, and then we had algorithmic tools like Grasshopper and so on. So it, it and it doesn't force you to do anything. You know uh, you, the fact that you've got a knife doesn't mean you're going to murder someone. You can do anything with a particular tool. But there are some things you can do that become easier with certain tools. And I think that's really what changed the, the uh, uh, that allowed, um, I don't like the word parametricism, I think it's completely wrong, but it allowed those kind of operations to, to happen. <laughs> I completely agree. And I would add there that there was this necessity for automation. And by automation, um, I mean, having something that deals with a repeating task that you would do uh, over and over again, where you were sketching manually or you were drawing manually in a software like AutoCAD, for example, that still has this old mentality in, in designing. So this necessity for automation is what led to what today maybe we call parametric modeling software or, or visual programming languages or whatever. Um, and, but I'm not sure whether, I mean, there is a little bit of a, a gray area there. What is the, what is a past tool? that affected how we design today. So for example, for me, a tool that existed and doesn't exist anymore is uh, GC, uh, like uh, generative components from Bentley. Uh, why did it die off? Um, is it because the main software couldn't support it? Um, did it affect how we design? Definitely, especially in our, in our uh, firm. Um, but um, I would like to hear everyone's opinion about what is a past tool that has affected um, today's design, and not in a. I mean, are we talking? Are we talking about an an aesthetic um, result, as in affected in terms of form? Because many people can argue that people start sketching because of the they were using 3D Studio Max, for example, in the early '90s. And which gave them certain capa capabilities with polygonal meshing, and they started creating this uh, beautiful and intricate forms. Um, yeah, what, think, what is an old tool? Yeah, I, I think this is a really good question for Nell uh, because we are young uh, uh, architects, so we still uh, in in a real lame or in the age of uh, Grasshopper and Dynamo. We still, uh, but I think. Uh, I remember when I was designing my uh, thesis project in SIAC, uh, uh, 
uh, there is uh, I, I used to use a, a, ref, a refit and sometimes using Rhino, uh, but there is a struggle if you want to do uh, a, a computational uh, uh, design process. Uh, so uh, I start to learn uh, uh, Grasshopper. Uh, so now I think the shift is it, like five years ago, we starting from Rhino and we built the, the 3D model manually in the Rhino. But now I think uh, when you open uh, 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 Rhino, you go directly to the Grasshopper to implement your idea. So I think it's the competitional thinking. It's, uh, it's more uh, important than the tool that you use. So if you have the computational design thinking, you can use any tool uh, to uh, like a Dynamo, Grasshopper, uh, Python for coding, and any uh, uh, tools. But I think uh, the, the, the thinking uh, of the wor your workflow and the thinking, it's more important than the tools that you're using or like what Neil said, the knife that you're using. Yeah. Uh, maybe I just... Yeah, uh, like building upon that, I feel that definitely the past tools uh, now I, that I compare, the approach has been modified and like taken a new form. So let's say if uh, uh, I was to design like a, a wall in Excel, like structural design, then later after a few years, I used like VBA to automate the structural design. Then later I automated that in Grasshopper. So look, the logical approach of design has take, evolved into like a new forms which have adopted. And sometimes that that is encoded in the components or the backend algorithm. No, I just wanted to throw in there that there's, that there, there's been a shift also in terms of uh, who is producing the software, right? Because in the old days, it was all corporate practices. Um, and now increasingly, they're open source. People are doing their own plugins for, for, for Grasshopper and things. And that shifted things entirely. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm super skeptical of these big corporate firms like Autodesk. So they've got like a stranglehold on, on some of many of these softwares. And uh, I think that's really regrettable. I think it, it, you know, it, it makes it too expensive for some people in some cultures around the world, for sure. And I, I, I'm open that I'm very welcome this possibility of, um, of, 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 of open source tools. Uh, you know, the, uh, it, for example, I don't know, processing, I think was one of the first that once became open source. Um, and, you know, I think we, we need to shift more in that direction from this kind of corporate world towards a, a more open, open source world. Totally agree. I think that's also why it's so important that there are changes in academia um, and the way that students are actually taught computational design because the earlier on they are taught it, the more likely they are to actually pursue it because I think it kind of falls into the hands of, you know, corporate to design these tools when not enough architects actually want to be involved in designing or even using that tools. Uh, for example, I know a lot of people, even in, you know, fifth year after five years of studying architecture, only know a handful of softwares, the only 3D modeling, one of which is SketchUp. Um, so a lot of people, you know, are kind of reluctant and scared. So unless something changes in academia to encourage more people to actually pursue these computational tools and perhaps equip them with the skills to help build them themselves. Um, I don't I don't see how it's gonna change that quickly. And maybe it's different other universities as well. Yeah, we just to say, I, I don't know how many of you have been following Digital Futures, but this was an initiative that we set up where everything is free, right? And part yeah. of the reason for doing that is to try and, you know, uh, challenge some of those structures in some ways. I mean, the, the idea is that, you know, if you can produce a system that kind of, it's a bit like Uber. I mean, Uber has improved taxi services no end. They, are, they have to improve. And that's what we're trying to do with traditional um, uh, educational systems. And it's, it's not just the tools, but also it's the fees that are being charged in some way. You know? And I think that is what is excluding a lot of people. And so what our initiative in terms of digital futures, everything is for free. No one's paid any everyone's for free, and they do it because they love it, you know, and, and that's important. And, and it means that it opens things up. One thing I noticed when I was teaching in Dessau, I don't know if anyone knows there's a school in Dessau that is almost totally free. Um, and it used to be a very progressive school when I was there. 
And, and I discovered that actually, frankly, you can get as much talent. Every country has talent. The top 2%, wherever you are, has got talent. And we got all these, we got the students from the poor countries, you know, from you know, uh, Bangladesh or, uh, you know, uh, uh, but super talented students, you know. And, you know, I think one of the, that, that kind of showed me that, and those people couldn't afford to go anywhere else. So, that really kind of uh, that was part of the impetus about trying to democratize education by making some of these things available. And I just want to say, just finish off by saying that maybe I'll, I've got something on my I didn't show it, but Maya Mystery is doing a, a session on Clip and, and, and uh, VQ GAN on digital futures uh, in the, the beginning of October, which is opening it up so anyone can go and watch that and become a part of that. And I think that is part of the initiative too, not just the, the tool, but actually having the kind of access to education. So, uh, but I, I really think we need to get beyond this corporate world and also this kind of um, this idea that you have to pay for your education. To my mind, I mean, I guess you guys in the UK don't realize how, how the National Health Service is completely free. It's also, from my experience, by far the best health service in the world. In the States, the first thing you've got to show is your credit card and your insurance firm before you get treated. And it's, it's iniquitous. I mean, the number of people who have been, I mean, I had a student at SIAC who had cancer and didn't have any insurance. So, you know, I think we've got to kind of break through some of those boundaries, of the, not just the tools, but also the educational system to try and update it and, and understand that education should be a human right and not a privilege of the wealthy. Yeah, I want to, uh, uh, I want to share my experiences. Uh, uh, originally, uh, like uh, quite a long time ago, I was using like uh, using like SketchUp, like Grasshopper, Reno, and uh, uh, gradually began to use like processing, like CAD, like this. And I, in my opinion, I think sometimes it's not like which two is like in the past or in the future. I'm thinking it's like, which kind of, uh, what kind of thing do you want to do? And uh, maybe which two can fulfill your demand, your request. And uh, so for now, because I'm doing like uh, application of AI in Abinina, so sometimes I find, I find different tools, they have their different limitations. So I give up all this, all these tools, like all these tools directly uh, develop the program develop the coding in the PyCharm uh, by myself. And that is like more open. So sometimes uh, different software, they have different kind of limitations. So it is hard to say which is uh, like, like from past, I mean, it, de uh, it depends what kind of thing do you want to do. And uh, according to my education uh, background and uh, at very beginning, I found like in at the beginning of 2000, so I found um, UCL and, and also some American university like Harvard, MIT and ETH, they share a lot of very amazing um, uh, designs. So we can see these designs, but when I did my uh, bachelor degree, so uh, we don't have the access to learn the logic of like at that time we call it the parametric design, right? So we don't have these access. So I have discussed the things with, uh, with my uh, tutor at that time. They said we can do some designs, designs similar, the appearance is similar, but we don't know the logic of the design. So sometimes, uh, but now like compared to now, we have a lot of different kind of summer school in China. So, uh, so we have this kind of um, access to, to learn the logic. And uh, 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 as Neil mentioned, so there's also now uh, whether it is free or not. But the thing is uh, like quite a long time ago, even if we want to pay, we don't have the access. So now I think uh, and like for, for example, in China, we have the access. We have also, and we, I know the Tongji University. We have the deep, digital future, and we have free access to to learn these things. So it means more people know the digi digital designs. And for example, in Wenzhou University, before I uh, work as a lecturer, at that time there was no uh like lecturers in my university who focus on a uh, digital so the students don't have this kind of access so i was the first uh, lecturer who uh, focused on this kind of research so i the student has this kind of um, uh, 
possibility to learn. And also, when I first told them about some digital designs, they 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 feel uh, so the the digital designs is like Zaha, so they don't they know the appearance of the design results. They don't know the, uh, the logic. So it is very important to have some like lectures and like like these kind of shows to to spread out. And also a uh, very important uh, and uh, I mean like like digital futures. So we can have this kind of access to learn. Yeah, I totally agree about the uh, the open resource uh, like a digital futures. And uh, I have to say also the uh, the initiatives from the uh, educated people like uh, Mayar, uh, his channel in a YouTube that uh, 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 like a, a meeting with the uh, people and uh, open the opportunity for uh, a new researcher to discuss their research. I think uh, we need to have more open resource. And I think uh, during the pandemic, we have that more than the, the more than the past. That's what I I feel like. Uh, three years ago, we don't have that open uh, resource uh, like lectures and all that kind of thing. But I think during the pandemic, uh, we have more of of these lecture. Uh, yeah. Speaking speaking of uh, universities and students, uh, I thought. Um, I thought I'd play the devil's advocate here and say um, how important are hand drafting techniques at very early stages of the student's architectural career? Are maybe tools limiting the way they think? Or, I mean, essentially, I, I'm imagining the idea of AI will be to self-think, right, to self-create. But um, as designers who are designing tools for uh, other designers, how important is you know, the early stage development of creativity or hand drafting techniques or getting the basics of architectural ideas in? I think it's extremely important that it shouldn't you know, be limited to hand drafting. And I remember from my experience of first year of university, it was, you know, you're not allowed to use any kind of computational tools. Here's your drawing board, here's your ruler, um, sit in studio until five in the morning, take this clock apart and draw an axiometric of it, which was a nightmare. <laughs> and, it, you know, it forced every single student to try to learn hand drawing, which I know because I'm, I'm not very good at hand drawing myself, uh, which meant my work suffered for it. Whereas I was introduced to computational tools sooner, which I introduced myself to actually in first year. Out of, <laughs> I, think, I think we're talking about, you know, computation out of necessity versus curiosity. And for me, it was definitely a sense of necessity um, and it, like looking for a way to express um, kind of more interesting computational forms that aren't exactly rectilinear, which is kind of what you feel like you may be limited to when you're just designing from a drawing board kind of perspective. Um, so I think also the kind of initial stages of the creative process tends to be kind of overlooked and we kind of tend to romanticize it and think that it's kind of this magical experience and really it's quite a scientific process that we can emulate. You know, it, is, it also functions a lot like um, machine learning models do in terms of we have all these, you know, data and experiences and memories that we collect in our subconscious, um, which, you know, random ideas eventually burst through as insight. And that's how we have our creative epiphanies. It's not some romanticized thing that's going to come up uh, because you're drawing for many hours, it's actually part of the research. And the more tools that you have access to and the more um, variety of designs, tools, and methodologies for design you know, then the more creative you can be. Yeah. Maybe I could just add, add something. I mean, I, you know, there's a danger that you end up like Prince Charles, right? I mean, you kind of complain about people, the kids today, because they can't spell out, they can't spell, they can't add up, they... They're kind of a generation of, of Beavis and Butted dis distracted television viewers. I mean, that's the danger, right? But the problem is, I think, you know, it's actually is, is that there are new skills that come along. We don't need to spell because of spell check. We don't need to add up because we've got calculators, you know. And, and I think multitasking is something that, that 
Prince Charles has no clue about, and it's what the new generation does. And I know I was brought up as in the old-fashioned way, and I, I happened to, I would always win the art prize, and what I did, and I used to win the calligraphy prize, but I really can't even read my own writing now because I typed so much. And I think, you know, we transition into a new set of skills, and they're, they're no better, no worse than, 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 than the last ones. They're just different and a more appropriate form of mechanism. I suspect that we won't even be drawing very much in the future. We'll be modeling things um, and, and tracking the hand movements and talking to our computers and things and, and so on. So it's not that the world doesn't get any worse or better. It just simply moves on to, to what are more appropriate forms of expression. Yeah, um, on that note, I think it's uh, what was discussed lately, it goes very well with the second question, actually, which is the present, which is how are these tools currently transforming the industry? And if you think talk about, uh, it has been mentioned during the discussion right now, but are digital, digital tools giving enough importance or not enough? So it has it been giving enough importance or should we give it more importance? And also should all architects learn to code or be expert in digital tools? And uh, how have you seen this digital tools affect your environment uh, or your industry, either in your office or in education? wherever it is that you're familiar with. I think um, the most interesting, oh, sorry. No, 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 go for it, go for it. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I think the most interesting kind of question is whether or not architects should learn to code and do everything from the ground up. And I think that is quite controversial because in a sense, it's really good to do, you know, what Marius is doing in practice, which is coding, you know, 75% of the time, having control of the, the tools that are actually being used by architects. But then it's also the case of, you know, the majority of architects are simply using these tools. And if all architects are spending all their time creating the tools, um, then there may almost be too many. Um, and I think we discussed this earlier actually with, um, with Theodore. It was one of the, the questions that kind of came up um, that was to, to use, you know, to utilize these, these new tools, even AI and ML, all you need to be able to do really is understand them you don't need to be able to code yourself, but as long as you, I think we were mentioning earlier the importance of computational design thinking as well. So as long as you kind of understand the logic and the thought process and what's actually happening in these models enough to, you know, be able to use them and piece pieces together from them. I think that's enough without having to code everything from scratch. Yeah, I want to um, <laughs> go back a bit to the previous one, uh, to the previous um, question. And I just wanted to mention that, that um, these tools, in a way, they enabled us to design the process. Whereas uh, up until that stage, we were designing the actual drawing. Um, so that for me is very important. So being able to design the process rather than the, the actual section of a building um, it's, it's something that gives you many uh, capabilities. And one of those is uh, as many tools that Neil actually showed, like SpaceMaker, you can have a wide range of, of design possibilities. You know, you're not limited to one outcome. Because as you mentioned, like these uh, processes are coming bottom up. Um, that being said, whenever I start building in, in a new piece of software, <laughs> I'm always drawing uh, a schematic of um, the relationships between elements. And um, I have to also read drawings that come from traditional architects coming back to me and they're saying, oh, we have an idea and how are we gonna make a parametric apple out of that? Um, but translating these uh, things into, into, into a procedural model, uh, it's very intriguing. And, um, but, do you need to sketch? Um, do you need to code? If you, for me, if you can get the job done, that's all I need. And obviously no one, not anybody needs to be coding. It's just utilizing the tools, as you said, uh, Georgina. Um, being able to use simple uh, uh, models or whether these are ML models, whether these are simply parametric models from Grasshopper, being able to tweak parameters um, save your time, automate things further, or even like go back to some specialist and say, okay, I want to implement this. And that comes back also to software being open source and even closed source um, 
proprietary uh, software that have very open communities, for example, like the one that generated, that uh, started uh, developing Grasshopper. I don't want to mention names here in terms of like advertisement or anything. But it's, it's, I think it's a very interesting era that we're living at because when I started learning how to code, uh, Visual Basic initially, then JavaScript, um, the resources weren't out there. Um, Stack Overflow was just picking up. You, you had errors and you didn't know where to look at. So I think now even, even it's, it's much better. It's much better on all aspects. Maybe I could just chip in something. And actually, I want to hear what my industry has to say about this because there are two, there are two camps, right? There's one that's the Randy Deutsch camp that we all have to be super users, which say super competent at all these kind of tools. But there's actually the opposite tendency, which is to say actually as tools get more uh, advanced, they become easier to use. I mean, Grasshopper is way easier to use than the coding that we used to do, you know, only 15 years ago. You know, much easier. And and I think you know if you think about a simple phone, you know, you that swiping or even facial recognition. I mean, very sophisticated uh, operations technologically, but very easy to do. And I, you know, interesting that a space maker actually kind of say, well, actually the real problem in the past in, in offices were that you, you'd you have to be a geek to be able to do all these things, whereas they want to make their tool easy to use. Easy to use. So you have this kind of two different operations, two different camps. The one that says we've got to be more super users and the one that says it's got to be so easy to use. And I think in the, in the long run, it's going to be both, right? I mean, most people will be able to do way more things without being so competition in advance, but we'll still need the kind of Maya mystery types to kind of the super users to kind of get under the hood, under the bonnet, as it were, and tinker around with the engine if you want to do something special. So that would be my, that would be my view. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's really important to, uh, uh, to uh, learn how to code. It's, it's uh, for now and for, for the time, I think it's really important to learn uh, to code, even the learning the code uh, is not personally uh, interest me, <laughs> but I think you have to learn to code because it, you will uh, put yourself, uh, if you architecture practicer, uh, you have to put yourself inside uh, uh, your team or within your team. So if your team working uh, using, for example, Grasshopper or uh, Dynamo, and uh, they're producing all kind of uh, models and drawing and all these kind of things from uh, that kind of script. So I think you need to uh, uh, follow them and you need to be uh, with them uh, coding. And uh, otherwise, uh, because in nowadays, uh, all the uh, architecture uh, firms, uh, they working, uh, not all of them, like most of them, they're working uh, using uh, uh, Revit, Dynamo, Grasshopper, and all the competitional uh, tools. So I think you have to uh, educate uh, yourself and uh, you have to uh, elevate your skills, uh, especially in, in, in the competitional tools to uh, be uh, with them in that uh Uh -huh. I just uh, would like to add that it's important to understand the language of code. And if you are in early stage, I would say like try out different things until you understand what's your strength. So for example, uh, your strength could be like, you can express your creative mediums through sketching better than algorithmic thinking. So it might be that a uh, medium could help you. But also like some people are, good at learning code faster. So they could express their creativity by experimenting with algorithms faster and produce more designs. But I, I must say that there's always like some limitation. Um, it comes if you don't learn that language. So you could use, let's say, tools like Spacemaker and gen do generative design, but you are depending on their assumption of the genetic algorithm they use. And if you want to tweak some parameter, you got to know what, how the code is constructed. And sometimes novel design happens when you mix few algorithms and try out new things. So it's also, uh, one could use AI model, but if they know the backend code, they can produce more creative mediums by combining multimodal. So uh, I must say like try out different things, understand your strength and at least know the language because 
let's say it's it's very difficult right now to develop a blockchain app because they have like specific language but if you know the blockchain algorithms and the importance of it you could find some translation in architecture and maybe combine and develop some stuff in my opinion i think uh so it is important to learn to code because if we want to use the digital tools if we don't have you know we don't know how to code so it will limit our um, ability so for for me i think like, uh, at the very beginning I, i found coding is very difficult and so at that time i tried to use the other method to to like uh, escape code but I've, at that time i found i spend more time and also these softwares and different kind of softwares limit me so i can't do something more so at that time i found it to to have more um like you, uh i mean uh, uh to uh like um, uh, achieve my mind my design mind so i have to learn the code but also in other in in the, uh, in, in on the other, other hand so you, you know we have in the architectural design we have different kind of streams Uh, in in my uh, uh, in Wenzhou University, some of my colleagues they they have holds different attitude towards like dif- digital digital tools. They still have some uh, like conservative uh, attitude towards design. So I mean, if you can uh, achieve your goal to uh, to design some uh, uh, some buildings or plans that can fulfill people's requests. It's okay. You don't have to code, but it is quite good if you can code. That will like um, like broaden your like uh, your your horizon. You have more abilities, and uh, I think uh, I think we have attached a lot of importance in in the today's industry and educations. So in 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 a lot of university in Wenzhou uh, in China, so we ha- we know the digital tools and the the school of, uh, afford uh, offer a lot of opportunity for students and for the for the teachers to learn the different the digital tools. So I think we have more uh, access to to learn this. So if we want to, um, uh, I mean. It is the most important thing is to know to understand algorithm thinking, and but if you want to dig more uh, deeply, so you you have to learn code. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask: Is there too much importance now given to coding and architecture? I and mean, what I imagine there can be. You know, former fear of missing out, and everyone would try to jump in into the bandwagon of coding and computation. So, in that process, how will even the role of architects change? I think we established that in order to be a successful architect. Most probably, you don't need to learn how to code. Um, I think I'm not sure about the numbers. I would like to see the numbers of of people, like uh, especially in the UK, which um, computation has been in the curriculum for many years in the architectural schools. I would like to see how many people actually utilize it in the everyday, and I mean, people architects. I mean, uh, how many? They utilize it in the everyday uh, uh, routine at work. Um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a very small uh, percentage, and that's because the amount of, let's say, renovations, uh, small houses, etc., that are being built around the UK and around the world uh, are much more than the big buildings of, um, you know, big corporations or towers or infrastructure. Um, Uh, projects or cultural projects that you have more freedom to explore different geometries. Uh, you have more freedom to automate stuff. You need this automation, for example. Um, so I do believe that it's a very good asset to have. 
And it, it has changed the role of the architect in the sense uh, that it has made this life easier. And not only the architect, if you are a contractor, for example, and you get a building from Zaha Hadid or from Foster's and you want to document all the panels, the glazing panels one by one. If you were to do this manually, you will have to have a hundred people working on this every day for a month. Yeah. Especially where, where these practices are actually having bespoke elements. Um, but if you have a programmatic way to do that and lay out flat the panels on a, on a, on a sheet or um, and I see that then it's going to be provide is going to be pushed into a CNC machine and start cutting the glazing. Then that saves you a lot of time, and at the same time, it saves you a lot of a lot of money. Um, but, but maybe I should just add something. I, mean, I think it's not just simply a question of making things easier. It seems to me that it kind of it opens up possibilities. I mean, I, I you know uh, I shouldn't I don't think we should see it as kind of humans versus AI, but rather AI as an extension. You know, as a kind of cyborg like extension of our intelligence. You know, and I think that uh, Elon Musk makes this comment that we're all kind of superhuman now because we've got these tools that can allow us to do things that we otherwise couldn't couldn't do. And I think you know, so from that point of view, it, it kind of it. it it, it, it increases or enhances what we can do ourselves. I, I was struck once by a review at the AA where I went to and there was, there was one student presenting and he said, like this, I looked at the options, there are six. And you think, why six, right? The next student came on, I looked at the options, I put them through the computer and there are 453. And to be honest, 430, those are really boring because they're all the same. But the point being that we actually have limitations as human beings. You know, and what this does is open up other possibilities so it becomes a prosthesis to the human imagination. And I think that's an important thing to, to recognize our limitations and to, to use these tools to open things up. But it, in some ways, actually, some of these tools can become like a use they can suggest possibilities we otherwise wouldn't have imagined ourselves yeah uh, 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 just a really quick uh, uh, this is from my experience uh, from USA and uh, from my uh, uh, country uh, Saudi Arabia I worked in uh, uh, two different uh, big firm in uh, uh, USA which is uh, Murphy's with the Tom main and then uh, in Saudi Arabia, I will not say the name, but uh, in a big firm in Saudi Arabia. So uh, both of them are big names. And one, they're using uh, digital uh, tools and the other one not using the digital or uh, they're doing it uh, like CAD, uh, the traditional way. So uh, what was uh, really fun uh, to see uh, Domain and Morphosis uh, have only uh, 15 uh, people in his team, but in the, uh, 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 the, big, the other big firm in Saudi Arabia, it has like more than 400 uh, people to work in. So if you compare between these, the kind of thing uh, that, that mean is not the, 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 the product that produced from Tom Main or from the Morphosis, it's uh, much uh, higher in the level and the details. It's not easier, it's harder to produce these kind of, of uh, sophisticated uh, 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 building and uh, in the short time with the short stuff. So uh, this is, I think it's, it's really important to, to compare this in the practice also, not only in, in an architecture uh, uh, individual. Can I just add something about Tom Main? Because I, Tom Main is actually, he, he, and he doesn't use AI, right? But he knows Wolf Pricks very well. He's kind of following what's going on. And he actually endorsed my book. Um, but actually what the way that Tom, Tom has I think about 70 people in his, in his office, but the way he puts it, this is kind of interesting in some ways, is he said, I would really welcome AI because actually when you've got, you know, AI, you don't need so many people. You could have 12 people could do the job of 70 people, which is great. He says, I could get to know them really well because I don't really know all 70 in my office. But the trouble is when you've got 12 people in office instead of, instead of 70, then, uh, then you've lost 58 uh, uh, posts for architects, right? That's what happens. That's right. Yeah, I I would like to add a point that right now, like Vina, you mentioned about form of like coding. I think it also it's heavily dependent on the context 
you will right now also will observe like a lot of countries who are still using sketchup who have no idea about the possibilities of grasshopper and platforms like digital futures are not only providing like possibilities but also opportunity to learn so i think the access accessibility is getting better and better for people to learn these mediums but i also find like in the industry you will observe that there are people developing uh, generative tools and grasshopper scripts but there are also a set of people who are going with the traditional method and are not adopting so i think as it might be also important to consider how we can make the transition e easier and develop like good user interface and experience where more people are encouraged to experiment with these tools and even if i say right now ai is going to change architecture no one is just going to start learning ai right now it's until until they realize that oh it's going to change the way we work and we design then they are going to put more time and effort into it i think it's also realizing that it's going to change the way that we work and design in a positive way because i think a lot of people actually have a fear of ai i mean obviously like you said me also many people may lose their jobs to automation but the whole idea is it gives us more time to do other more important things right so automation can take over so many of those simple mundane everyday tasks so maybe we could put um, more emphasis on the idea of um, you know the creation of ideas but i think it's interesting then when you get to those kind of you know the, the kind of artificial creativity um, or beat you can kind of outputs that are actually giving you ideas. So when AI actually starts to take hold of that part of the process, as well as the automation, um, I mean, I'm not sure what that means for the future of the architect. I think we will, you know, still be co-creators, but, you know, I wonder what the extent of our role would be in the future when AI has such a deep role in architecture. I, I don't think... Well, I mean, there's a lot of uh, speculation, a lot of discussions uh, about this topic uh, ever since there has been some automation. Uh, AI, machine learning, in my mind, it's not there yet in our industry, uh, at least on in terms of other practical applications. Uh, it can be. But would it really affect the profession itself? I hope, I hope not. And I'm pretty confident, confident that it's not going to make it what is going to make is going to um, decrease and shrink the project times. Um, so previously you would need, I don't know, 15, 20 years to design and complete a building. Um, so, so let's take uh, Sagrada Familia, for example. A building of that complexity is not even built yet. It's like in more than 100 years. Um, why is that? Is this a profession? Our profession is very, very slow. It's very slow. And what's going to happen? And I hope it happens because I'm very, as a person, I'm, I get bored very easily. So if I work on the same project for two years, I'm just like, seriously, I, I, I don't want to look at the screen anymore. It would, I think our profession is going to become uh, more high paced. Is going to come in par with under, other industries that do that. For example, the software engineering industry. When you try to build the software, you know, you, you just make a plan that is two or three months long. You don't need more than that. That's what's going to happen with architecture. And then it comes a question, okay, um, how much are we going to build? <laughs> which is which is an answer that I don't have to. But uh, my my wish is that Architects are not going to be replaced. It's just our schedules, our, our project schedules are going to become very smaller and hopefully more interesting. Yeah, 100% I agree about that. I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about uh, the architecture it's, or the firm of architecture. It will be multidisciplinary not only the architect that work in the firm. So we can have like a competition or like a, a software engineering and we have another uh, kind of, of, uh, of app, like a, of discipline that uh, uh, be next to the architecture. Uh, but I think, yeah, exactly 100% uh, right. It, it will be the schedule or uh, the time frame of the project it will be shorter and then uh, you can have like multiple or uh, five or six projects at the same time. 
Yeah, I think yeah, I think your point it's it's uh, it's hundred percent right. Does this increase pace to design also increase the pace of construction? And then how does that actually intersect with the climate crisis? Because surely we should be kind of slowing down the pace of construction and you know the the amount of materials that we're utilizing that are bad for the planet. And if design suddenly becomes so much not necessarily easier but so much faster, then. <laughs> How will this kind of reflect what is actually built? Are we going to be iterating more designs? And kind of maybe does it give us more time and more energy to, to try lots of other, you know, uh, design options before we construct? Or will this lead to an increase in construction? Maybe you're thinking like in the, about the different thinking in the in the in the project. So the design it will be like in really fast and really easy. So we will start thinking about. Uh, uh, structure uh, or if you do like the machine learning it's uh, from the structure so we were thinking about uh, landscape and how the landscape it will help the architecture so we will focus and we will uh, spend more time in another issues uh, not in uh, like design issues so another issues that help the design not into like a specific uh, design yeah I think, uh, sorry, Bo. Oh, you go first. Yeah, I think like uh, for sustainability, I think there are areas of improvement in terms of design coordination. So I, I really like Speckle tool for data inter interoperability, where right now, if you see like architecture design and structure design, there are sometimes uh, opportunities where because of some miscommunication, there are errors at site or something. and. Also, if you look at tools like Canova, they are doing like embodied life cycle analysis, built-in code compliance check, built-in. So right while you're designing, when you're selecting options, you will be recommended like you are doing typing in your uh, phone that these are the better design material options you should consider. And so those are the ways like uh, one could like integrate sustainability in, uh, in the process itself. And one thing uh, I wanted to, uh, raise about the number of people in the profession. I I think the the profession uh, needs like people to evolve. So, for example, when like there were mechanical machines, like mechanical engineers adopted like new role. There are people still working, but so the the way I see is like architects turning UI UX designers, building participatory design website, architects turning data scientists, and doing like helping construction firms or design firms. So it's it's this time where computational should be like explored and think about ways we can impact the workflow and the industry. Okay, I want to share uh, uh, my uh, one of my research my in my uh, PhD research is I, I have a conduct a survey about the user acceptance of the AI in architecture and urban design. And I share my uh, uh, share my uh, uh, the the survey to the, uh, the the researchers in CMAUD and also in the WeChat group of AI forum and a lot of uh, professionals academics uh, they have replied me the and uh, um, according to my research result it is very interesting that we found that uh, people have uh, a neutral attitude a neutral attitude towards ease of use, towards uh, the AI, uh, the machine learning in uh, architecture and urban design. And people feel like modestly a uh, positive attitude towards uh, uh, the usefulness of the machine learning in, in architecture and urban. Um, and also the interesting is, is they still have a modest positive view to the intention to use and attitude to attitude. So it means that, so people have uh, a, a good view. I mean, if they have the modest uh, positive view to that, to this, but a very interesting is people did, I mean, the need, I mean, in the ease of use, people still holds uh, the neutral attitude. So I found according to different backgrounds, people have uh, advanced knowledge of that. Like like a lot of professors, like they have a quite um, have a advanced knowledge in this. They hold a, a, a negative view uh, on the the ease of use. So it means we still have a lot of challenge 
in the application of AI in 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 urban design. So, so we 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 can find a lot of like uh, practical project using AI. But people still hold uh, the, 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 I mean, the modest positive view for the, in the future. So I think, I think like um, now still we have a lot of challenge, but as we still, I mean, like, like we pr probably in the future, we, according uh, by education, more people can use, uh, uh, can code, uh, can code. And, um, and we have more uh, better deep generative models. Like, like several years ago, we didn't know more a gun. And we, we, now we have gun, we have iron, we have a lot of different kind of deep generative models. So, I mean, in the future, uh, with the development of AI or computer science, we may, uh, and a lot of effort of our, like, like us, a lot of researchers and architects, I think people can, we have a, 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 a good future, like uh, in the application of AI in architecture. Thank you both for that. That, that was a very good, uh, I would say, conclusion on that topic. And I would, uh, I would just like to throw out one uh, final question about the future. So uh, all this while we were talking about how it is essentially time saving and we can maybe focus on bigger problems. So I would say what other future crises are targeted or can be targeted or aided through digital tools and architecture or what are the most important um, crises that we should probably uh, focus on? You mean, what do you mean crisis? As in there is a problem, a, 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 a bottleneck. A problem, a bottleneck. Yeah. Like say a climate crisis or um, something yeah. along those lines. I think there is there is a consensus uh, within this panel. I mean, most of us are advocates of the um, of the computational thinking. There is a, a consensus that you know um, things have been turning from parametric modeling to generative modeling to um, genetic algorithms and design space exploration. Um, whatever you want to call it, and they're moving towards an, an era where ML and artificial intelligence is what has been, the, whole, the, the trend is leaning this way. And, and that's very, very apparent uh, from uh, Neil's presentation. I mean, all of his students are excited to work with this. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Neil. Um, so it is something that is very exciting. Um, but yet again, there is a major problem. And for me, that's the reason that we haven't adopted uh, machine learning in specific. And artificial intelligence, okay, I think it's a bit ahead in our industry, at least. Um, there is a reason for that. And that's mainly the source of our data. Um, just like why why we haven't done it? Is it because people are not uh, good enough? People don't know how to code in architecture. Is it because we have an narrow-minded people? I don't think so. Especially in the the schools, in the architecture architecture schools, there is always uh, some innovation. Professors are pushing towards innovative thinking. Why we cannot implement it in real life? And that's because our data are not useless, but they're not in a state that can be used for machine learning or predictive modeling. I mean, I, I haven't seen what the Theodora said um, uh, earlier because I was obviously working. Um, but I mean, I, I've, I've been following what they were they've been doing in Vienna, et cetera, and my good friend um, Angelos is there as well. And all these uh, models, they're using synthetic data sets, right? So I mean, these guys actually spend time creating the data set which trains a model and then gives uh, the surrogate model that they're using and it, it, it predicts uh, a result. As an industry, we produce lots of data. I would say more data than other industries, but these data are very, are highly unstructured. There's no labeling. We cannot uh, do any proper augmentation. Um, and hence, 
they're just practically useless. So I think if as an industry and as a profession, we try to find ways to produce data that are um, in a way kind of good to utilize or better or labeled or structured or follow a schema uh, that we can use with machine learning. And then this is going to take us to the next step. Yeah, uh, you're right. And I have a, a really uh, example about that. Uh, when I uh, do uh, my uh, PhD research, uh, I try to, uh, because I have an a, a idea of classification, the classify the building and ground relationship. So uh, I have to uh, give uh, uh, the machine learning uh, uh, like a, a big amount of data and there is no 3D, uh, uh, like three building, 3D building data that you can uh, uh, feed, uh, feed them to the machine learning. So uh, this is, it was uh, uh, my problem at the first. And then I come up with the rules uh, to uh, create synthetic data. Uh, to uh, train the model, like exactly what you said. So uh, I think th we have a problem in the, the uh, architecture data, and I think uh, open resource of or everyone, if he uh, have a model, uh, open the resource, open the resource, or open the data for the others. Uh, open uh, the, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the environmental data for uh, the tower, uh, Al-Bahra tower example, or open the data, open uh, uh, the resource. It will help the machine learning and it's help us too. But it's not only opening, that's a problem. It's uh, the processing being, the being data. coherent data. Yeah. Being, the, being uh, all this data have to adhere to, to, specific, to a specific schema. If exactly. we want to say that we're really doing machine learning in this industry, we have to start looking at our data first. Uh, I must say, like, although that's the current situation, sadly, but I'm seeing moments where architects are collectively doing data set uh, annotation and doing, like, especially I came across Matthias Del Campos, like, of flow plan. Uh, Annotation. There is like one uh, one data set from Arch Daily by uh, University of Singapore. But although, like, I must say, like, the reason or uh, one of the reason we see such open source data set in uh, CS world is like the amount of funding and research that is going into those areas compared to here. And also, our industry has like confidentiality issues where people are not comfortable enough to share that data and what if they find some uh, areas of improvement in their design and people start <laughs> commenting. So that is one thing. But uh, re uh, coming back to the question of uh, crisis, I think uh, there are a few things I, I have, I'm very bullish on. So like for evidence-based design, like I think the subjectivity uh, will reduce with the help of neurotech devices because let's say people like say biophilia is good, but how much percentage is good? What arrangement is good? And once you get like instant response in your neurotech waves that, okay, there are some, some alpha waves or some waves which are corresponding to a good state of mood, like that kind of uh, design validation is, is gonna be very useful. And also there are some research going on where people are trying different design in VR world before implementing that design in real world. So that is a one interesting area. And also coming back to the point of crowd, uh, like data set, uh, I'm, I'm learning more models of in blockchain where people are doing like collective crowdfunding and doing and like solving a mission. So I think there might be some opportunities where we can uh, do like crowd data set annotation or crowd computational ML tool development, which has a good potential. And Lastly, I think the the level of abstraction ML model provides are a great. Like if I say do a sketch of dream of a child, 
it's difficult for my for most of most of the humans to like do sketch but like we could and plus clip can do it so if i say i'm doing precedent study from pinterest or arts delhi and doing that abstraction versus abstraction from machine learning who has like learned that data it's a different kind and that has some opportunities of adaptation so and also i was i had an interesting discussion about so about communication in design itself where we think we have some vision we are limited by the materials and medium to have convert that vision into mediums of 2d drawings and 3d and then we communicate to client but uh, what if like in vr we and the client are in the same space and we are re- reducing the opportunities of miscommunication that is another area. i think what you mentioned there about um being able to capture people's uh, comfortness like being comfortable feeling comfortable in a space or uh or something like that is is very interesting um i haven't thought about it but i what i failed to mention previously is that the only piece of data that we have and is structured in our industry is the iot data uh so data that come from smart buildings because there there are mechanisms in place that record things in a specific way and for me and i mean uh, feel free to prove me wrong uh, if you start um, getting uh, people's emotions uh, uh, I, i feel that these pieces of data are very useful because uh, they record a specific state a state of the building a state of the of the of the, of the environment around the building and uh, they can help us a lot in the future to design better okay um well i think it's been a very 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 uh, good discussion i i know that people are excited the comments there are links being shared and um before we finish um neil asked permission to show a tutorial Now one thing I think is important for uh for all of us to stay connected so if anybody has like a LinkedIn page a web page YouTube page whatever it is leave them in the in the chat um so we can all have the same information I know that again there has been an active uh especially Neil has been sending a lot of links so if anybody else wants to share uh from the panelist uh, your social network whatever it is you want to share leave them there Um and on that note I will give the word to Neil to show the quick tutorial. Um you're mute uh it's muted. Yeah, let me just um shed uh sorry. Uh actually I mean it's it's nothing that's not in the in the chat already. Um but I'm just thinking if you do um make this into a, a video and upload upload it um Uh, I should say that if that's there for years, it's going to be 2nd October 2021, which is in a few, a couple of weeks' time. And I just want to say that there's also this is a resource that we put out there for everyone to use, right? So Digital Futures, every single one of those YouTube videos are really useful. Um, and it, actually, the last week's one was very interesting because we had a, a group of unbelievably talented Chinese scholars who'd come and like like Bolin studied in in the in, in outside of China came back and were doing amazing things and I, they were what it was doing just to kind of answer this some of these questions like what they were doing is actually reinventing what architecture itself is in other words they were looking at VR and AR as a kind of realm of of production frankly you know and I think that one thing that we are limited by if we still take keep the old model the thing that it's that architecture is about form um and just form alone i think that we're missing out on a lot of things i think that you know the future of the city is going to be governed not by new forms you know zaha buildings or whatever it's going to be in, um, governed by informational processes you know i think the kind of the way for example that uh, in china um city brain is 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 being used as a, as a as a digital model to relieve the traffic problems in in many cities is is kind of talking about the way that things are going forward i also think that maybe instead of building and rebuilding we're probably going to have more intelligent buildings that are going to be changing the be adaptive to the way we want to use them especially under covid when when houses have become offices i can see that's to be the domain where where things are going to happen so it's not just simply that old fashioned model of bricks on on mortar and kind of thing like that, but actually thinking about architecture and, and really 
um, imaginatively redefining what architecture itself should be. Um, and I think, you know, fr frankly, this is a kind of a final sort of comment on design, um, is that, you know, I think for every student of architecture right now, the most important design that everyone has to do is not a building, but their own career. Now, what is going to happen in the future? The world is going to change for sure. And it's a question of kind of being aware of the changes that are going to happen. So anyway, I want to just kind of put this up here. There are a bunch of tutorials here. Digital Futures have a whole series of things on AI. There's a particular series I did over the summer called Hitchhiker's Guide to, to AI, which is six, six sessions long. And then the FIE Doctor of Design program where Theodorus Galanis was part of it. There are 12 sessions on AI there. Uh, this session here is going to be, a, I, I think it's going to be super popular. Clip and VQGAN is just producing some weird, bizarre and interesting things. And I think in some ways it might be here that we might begin to sort of see some of those kind of questions raised, I mean, answered. You know, I think the, the question about labeling is an issue. And just to say that, you know, I think for, um, for Wan Yu in China, they have to, they can't use Japanese data. They've got to use Chinese data because of the building codes. And they have a, a whole industry of labeling going on. But I suspect that in the future, self-supervised or, or, or other forms of learning are going to come in, which are going to make that that whole realm much more different. But um, but I do think that kind of the, the, the clip, I do think that GPT, whenever GPT-4 comes out, that's going to kind of completely revolutionize a lot of things. And I think that the fact that they're already linking um, uh, data to images or, or, or rather text to images, and maybe I want to just, maybe I'll just want to leave Maya with a final comment because he's not only doing the tutorial, I want him to say something about the tutorial, but also about whether the, whether that whole issue of labeling might be uh, re resolved through, through GPT-3, 4, 5, and 6. Maya, over to you. Yeah, like, uh, so, one very interesting fact about clip is contrastive learning so it pairs like a uh, mapping of images to words so many times like uh, uh once the machine le like the model learns how to map like orange image to orange word like multimodal if you present a new kind of data sometimes like even if it's not seen in the data set it will be able to produce new images so the world of like uh, self-learning, uh, self-supervised learning where like just based on the data, the machine learning model can learn. And there's also a new amazing trend of meta learning where teaching machines learn to learn. So like based on few tasks, they'll like compete against each other and then they are able to do generic uh, task uh, completion. So it's GPT-4, GPT-5 is like, it's going to provide amazing opportunities. I have like tested GPT-3 like it like it's all like helped me a lot in like essay preparation and thesis for architecture and like also some amazing contrast and feedback on my essay. So it's out there. Yeah, I I, just, I wanted this fun final comment essays because I got so many essays. And they're really good ones on AI. I was I was thought, hold on a second, are my students kind of generating these automatically? And they were. But actually, if you've seen what, what GPT-3 can do, especially that interview with David Chalmers, it's mind blowing because it's so convincing. I think in the future it's gonna be a it's it's gonna be a big issue. Could people just be generating their, their essays on this thing? But you no, know, I, I share that and I you know I, I think that I would just say watch this space because there's something hugely important that's going on in that sort of realm. And I just want to maybe a final comment. The, the GPT-3, which of course David Chalmers talks about, he has got a whole new book coming out in January about what's called Reality Plus, where he's looking at AR, VR and things and all these things. I think our whole horizon is being reconfigured by these new technologies. So we've got to you almost introduce a new vocabulary in terms of the terms that we're using for this new horizon. It's, it's radically changed the domain of architecture and we have to kind of keep pace with it ourselves. So anyway, that's a, that. if anyone wants to do a, 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 a kind of a screen capture, as you've got anything else to get that, there is, it's there. And um, I look forward to Maya Mysteries thing. I, I We also have some other workshop we've got, but this Saturday I think is one on, we got one in Grasshopper coming up. We had one on Rhino, and these areas now have been opening up in a, in a way that makes them accessible to students from all over the world. So I hope that you guys make use of these things. They're they're there for you. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, and say uh, thank you. And what I want to say is, oh, it's a final comment. I was expecting a bunch of Welsh Welsh accents today, and actually, oh my God, if I look at the names here, and maybe this is a reflection of the UK today, uh, but not a single kind of Welsh name or Welsh accent, which is kind of interesting. But um, 
Uh, I'm glad that you guys have been in Cardiff for being more progressive in the approach than, than my tutors were at the University of Cambridge. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much for everyone for participating. I think the discussion was very important. Maybe um, in the Instagram post on LinkedIn, we could start like a thread for all the things that we could not talk in, in the panel. Um, and thank you everyone, the panelists for being here. Um, it's been amazing. And also for everyone, we are in 22 people right now. So for everyone who was here and have left, also thank you for being here. Um, Yes, uh, and yeah, I think that's it for for today. Thank, thank you for you organizing. Much. It was awesome. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank, thank you very much. much. It's been amazing. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Nice to meet everybody. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Bye.